How's it going, Zach? You having a good morning? So far, sir. How are you? Just uh, a little wet, but other than that, fine. Very good. Have a good day. Thank you. Zach, you still there? Yes, sir. Do we need to log into PrimeGov? We're not voting on anything today, are we? Yes, you'll need to log into PrimeGov. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're going to get started. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us for the City of Oklahoma City's teleconference uh, City Council meeting. We have a few announcements to make regarding this teleconference meeting. If the teleconference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 30 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to later today, May 4th at 1 o'clock p.m. via teleconference or a different time if we have the opportunity to state it. The agenda and documents are located on OKC.gov. Anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item, public hearing, or to speak under citizens to be heard, 
please call 405-297-2391 or text 405-219-7987 or email cityclerk at okc.gov. Speakers will be allowed three minutes to comment. After three minutes, the speaker's microphone will be muted and a 30 second reminder will be provided prior to the microphone being muted. Um, all participants, except for the council members, please, please keep your phones on mute until you are recognized. Uh, you may press star six to speak uh, and unmute yourselves. And of course, council is always open to uh, asking questions or speaking at any time. And we didn't have a pastor this morning, so I would ask uh, City Manager Craig Freeman if he would lead us in an invocation before we call a meeting. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings that you give us every day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to serve our residents. I thank you for our elected officials, for the mayor and the council, for their dedication of service to our residents and leading our community. Thank you for uh, the many employees that we have in our city that just serve so diligently. And I thank you for the way that they serve. I ask that you would just give us wisdom and guidance as we go through these discussions today about the budget and the important decisions that are made about the services uh, that we'll provide to our residents. Help us, Lord, to treat each other with respect and kindness and to um, respect each other's opinions and understand and hear each other. I ask that you would just bless as we go through this time that you would give us wisdom. Help us, Lord, to um, conduct this meeting in a way to be honoring to you and conduct our lives in a way to be honoring to you. And I ask that you would just bless us now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Oh, Thank you, Mr. City Manager. I call this meeting of the City Council to order. And we have no items under Office of the Mayor, so we will proceed to item three, items requiring separate votes. There is one item today to be voted on, that is item 3A, a resolution setting City Council public hearing dates of May 18th and June 1st, 2021 for budget-related presentations and public comment on the proposed annual budget for fiscal year 2022 and setting June 8th, 2021 as the formal City Council public hearing on the proposed annual budget for fiscal year 2022, at which time the City Council will consider and discuss the proposed budget and may adopt the budget as proposed or amend it, reject it, or defer it to a later hearing date and directing appropriate publication. Um, today, of course, is the day that we uh, begin consideration of the City Manager's proposed budget. And uh, I think to maybe just, uh, I don't know, Mr. City Manager, if you have more to say about the resolution. Yeah, I just uh, appreciate all the work that goes into preparation of this budget. Um, the, there's so many um, hours that are dedicated by so many different employees, and we really do work to make sure that our process is decentralized and those departments that are on the front line providing the services help to prepare the budget. And so I really appreciate that. Um, and this will set this opportunity for us to have these hearings over the next few weeks. Uh, to be able to present um, at least those that are the most outwardly facing budgets uh, to the council and for the citizens. And so I just uh, appreciate that opportunity. All right, now this resolution is again, really just setting the timetable for consideration of the city manager's budget. And uh, I don't know that it needs much discussion. So we can go ahead and maybe take a motion if that's the council's will. See, I'm not seeing it on my prime gov, but I see it on the video screen. We have a motion in a second. No, yeah, no, I did that. I've learned that trick over the years. Uh, okay. So I guess if everybody else can vote, cast your votes, and I'll cast mine verbally, and it's an I. And uh, we're, we're missing Councilwoman Nice. I don't see her. It, okay. it showed on my screen that it did it, so I don't know what to say about that. All right. How would you like to vote? Yes, which it was already green on my screen. Okay. Passes unanimously. All right. Now we'll move to item four. That concludes the votes today. Now we just have presentations on various departments. Uh, item four is presentations and discussion of FY21 proposed budget. And item A is a budget overview, and then will be followed by presentations from the fire department, the municipal courts, and the police department. And I'll kind of turn it over to the city manager from here. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. First up, we're gonna have Doug Dowler, our budget director, 
um, provide an overview of the budget, just give kind of a high level look at our revenues, our assumptions, our expenditures. Um, this year has been a, a, a challenging year. This past year's budget has been a challenging year as we went through dealing with COVID, made several adjustments in our budget that really affected our, our employment. You know, we reduced staffing. Um, it's affected services to our residents. Our employees have done a great job of trying to work through that. Um, this year, because of during this year, our revenues have actually performed better than what we anticipated. Um, uh, we're actually ahead of budget on those revenues, and we've been monitoring that as we've talked about the sales tax, but it really has kind of set the stage and put us in a position where we are for this year and then looking at some growth going into next year's budget that we were able to restore many of the services uh, that we eliminated last year. It's not always position for position. Um, Doug will walk through some of that, giving us an overview. And then again, as we go through the department budgets, we'll see that. So we were, we're able, able to restore some services, uh, but not all of those services. And so we'll, we'll talk about those in some of the areas um, where we're able to uh, get those restorations made. And then some other places where we've needed to make some additions with just different changes in service needs. And so we'll work through that. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Doug. Let Doug walk us through the overview of the budget. Yes, good morning, Mayor and Council. I'm Doug Dowler, Assistant Finance Director and Budget Director for the City. I'm pleased to present the proposed uh, fiscal year 22 budget. Uh, before I uh, go through that, though, I'd like to thank my team for the Office of Management and Budget and just take a brief moment to introduce them. Our Management and Budget Specialists are responsible for the various areas of the budget process. Lori Hurd manages the Leading for Results process. Jeff Mosier is over the revenue side of the budget. Letitia Jackson oversees expenditures, and Ian Hutchison works on the capital budget. Our analysts work in those areas and work with departments on the development and implementation of the budget. Uh, Daniel Dorgan is a senior management and budget analyst. Nicole McGrew, Jennifer King, Steve Akins, and Christina Hankins are our management and budget analysts. And we have a great team that's worked hard. I'm proud of the results of their work that you have before you. So as we look at the overall proposed budget, it totals $1,648.6 million. That's a decline of about 2.4% due primarily to the decreases in the MAPS 3 and Better Street Safer City funds as they spend down their remaining balances. With MAPS 4 working to finalize the implementation plan, we did not budget the balance in MAPS 4. You can see the impact of those funds reflected in the non-operating funds that de they declined about almost 8% uh, to about $902 million. The general fund is up 6.8% over the current year budget to $496.4 million. This is due primarily to growth in sales and use tax. And the fact that as, as uh, the city manager mentioned, we've ended up doing better this year than expected. So it's given us a strong base on which to grow next year. Our other operating funds are up 2.1% at $249.7 million. And kind of significant operating funds include the airports, utilities and stormwater drainage utility funds, as well as the fire and police sales tax funds. So taking a look at some of the highlights in the budget for this next year, all positions in the budget are fully funded. In this current year, 57 positions were frozen. All of those are fully funded in FY22. The FY22 budget adds 109 positions. Most of those are restorations of positions that were cut in FY21, but there are some addition, additions or enhancements. The FY22 budget sets aside $300,000 to provide initial funding for a mental health response component for police. In addition, a million dollars is set aside for funding recommendations from the task forces and working groups on community policing, human rights, and homelessness. Those reserves are established in the non-departmental budget and will be transferred out to the appropriate departments as those recommendations come out. In the fire department, the FY22 budget fully funds overtime for firefighters. The police department adds three civilian crime scene investigators. In the parks department, uh, positions are restored in order to return to a two week mowing frequency in parks. Staffing is added for the new Willa D. Johnson Recreation Center as is funding for temporary operation of the Pete White Senior Center as we work to uh, find a new contractor for that uh, center. The First Americans Museum is slated for opening this fall and the FY22 budget contains $750,000 in operating support for the museum. The Chickasaw Nation is also providing $2 million for operations as part of the agreement between the state, the Chickasaw Nation and the city. A homelessness program coordinator position is added in the planning department and this position is being jointly funded by the Arnall Family Foundation, the Inasmuch Foundation and the city. The FY22 budget contains three business intelligence specialist positions in development services, fire, and police, 
And these positions are intended to help provide a higher level of data analysis capabilities to help the city better leverage the systems and data we already have in order to improve operations. In the public transportation and parking department, the frequency on Route 18 is uh, proposed to be improved from every hour to every 30 minutes. This route provides service to Northeast Oklahoma City. Uh, Spokies and River Cruise funding is available for the full year. It's restored to the full year. And funding is added for uh, future bus replacement and to increase funding for Embark operations. Uh, we've been using CARES Act money to help supplement uh, the general fund support for Embark, and this will help uh, us begin to work that back as, as that funding declines. In public works, a bike lane maintenance crew is added along with a coordinator for the local business utilization program. Dredging on the Oklahoma River is also being brought in-house in public works rather than through a contract. And finally, utilities is adding a small staff as the city begins operating the water and wastewater system at Tinker Air Force Base. So as I mentioned, this coming year, we're proposing an increase of 109 positions, about 2.3% more than the current year. Uh, this is in addition to the 57 positions that were frozen in FY21 that were fully funded in FY22. Uh, and so for this chart, uh, I've included the FY18 amendment. You can see uh, where we've been uh, since we added the Better Street Safer City quarter cent sales tax. Uh, you can see that we're almost to the same level of positions that we were in FY20, which was uh, pre-pandemic levels. We're not quite there, just a few positions below that. This year, uh, this past year, council resolution set a 20-day comment period that would be uh, open for the proposed budget. And we've got a number of different methods for people to submit their comments. Uh, on okc.gov slash budget, there's a page for submitting content comments, as well as the full budget document uh, for people who want to review that. They can email comments to uh, an email address we've specifically created for this purpose, budget comments at okc.gov and the city clerk's office will be monitoring that uh, email address. We, uh, you can send a text to the Action Center 405-252-1053 or simply mail a letter to the city clerk. The comments will be compiled by the city clerk. We'll provide a summary of that and at the June 1st council meeting, uh, those comments will be presented so you have those uh, prior to June 8th when uh, the, the budget will be uh, considered for adoption. As we kind of talk about the schedule, uh, again, today we have fire, municipal courts, and police, as well as an opportunity for residents uh, to be heard. Uh, likewise, on May 18th and June 1st, we'll have presentations from departments and an opportunity for citizens to comment. And then on June 8th, uh, is the official public hearing and bu budget adoption uh, with the, uh, that's the, the plan. And then July 1st is the start of the fiscal year for FY22. So today I'm just gonna provide a very general overview of the budget and start with our driver uh, for the whole budget, really our revenues. So our largest recurring revenue source is taxes. Uh, taxes total $700 million or 43% of our total and sales tax is the largest source in the category. It's over $468 million uh, of the total. Other areas to note are fund balance, our second largest revenue source, and uh, MAPS 3 and Better Street Safer City account for more than half of the fund balance that's being budgeted in FY22. I would also note that federal grants includes $125 million in revenue from the American Rescue Plan Act. Although I would note we have not received guidance from Treasury uh, on how we may uh, specifically utilize those funds, nor have we received the funds yet under the act, but it is anticipated that we will receive those uh, through fiscal year FY22. As we turn to the operating portion of the budget, revenue total $746.2 million. The operating budget strips away our capital and non-operating funds like MAPS-3. Uh, this gives you a better perspective on the resources that are available to provide services to residents. Operating funds are up 5.2% uh, compared to FY21. And when we look specifically at the general fund, the distribution is somewhat similar to the operating budget with taxes making up 72% of the total and sales tax accounting for 53% at $263 million. Use tax has become a, a bigger portion of the general fund and is projected to total $80 million or 16% of the total. So sales and use tax account for more than two thirds of the general fund uh, revenue. Turning to the expenditure side of the budget, we'll look first at the overall total. And these are using the categories that are outlined in the Municipal Budget Act. Personal services is the largest category at 33%, followed by services, which includes contracts, utilities, chargebacks, 
The capital outlay is the third largest category at 24%. When you narrow into the operating budget, the amount going toward personal services becomes the majority. As we exclude most capital expenditures and move into operations, people become the primary expense there. Likewise, as we focus in on the further on the general fund, personal services is the vast majority of expenses at 72%, other services at 21%. And in addition to things like utilities, contracts for services, uh, this category also includes our payments to COTPA, and chargebacks for internal services funds like IT, fleet, risk management, and print shop. Supplies, capital, and transfers are fairly small and total 7%. And I would point out that capital funding doesn't really even show up as a category here uh, in the general fund, but that's because we budget that as a transfer uh, to our capital improvement fund. We have $6,250,000 budgeted for capital for things like uh, capital building maintenance, fleet replacement, and those sorts of things that we will spend in the capital improvement projects fund. So if we take a look at the general fund by service area, you'll see in broad terms where we spend general fund dollars, public safety makes up the majority at 63%. And you can see the other categories are between nine and 17%. So the city's annual budget process is one of the key pieces in our strategic planning process. You all are familiar with our process. It begins with our annual resident survey feeds into council priorities and strategic business plan development. Those plans then inform the budget development in departments. In addition to the regular performance reporting that we provide city council, we also meet monthly with the city manager's office to review data from departments and departments are using their data throughout the year to monitor performance and evaluate their programs. Uh, in 2017, the council adopted a set of priorities to guide the city. Uh, these, uh, throughout the, the document, you'll see these little icons uh, in places, uh, those areas that are supporting those specific uh, priorities. As we develop the budget each year, there are standards and best practices we follow. Obviously, we follow state law in the development of our budget, and you'll see that in the fund summary section of the budget book. This is the section of the budget book that is officially adopted. And that was in the notice that, that's being published uh, today. Um, uh, that, and that structure is spelled out in the Municipal Budget Act. The Governor's Finance Officers Association rep operates the Distinguished Budget Presentation Award that recognizes governments that follow the guidelines established by the National Advisory Council on State and Local Budgeting and GFOA's best practices on budgeting. budgeting. Each year, our budget is reviewed by GFOA and peer reviewers to see if we meet those best practices. GFOA looks at our budget document not only as a financial document, but also as a communication device and an operations guide. And in Oklahoma, only five other jurisdictions received the award last year. FY20 was the 33rd year Oklahoma City has received this recognition from GFOA. Again, this year, we've divided the book into two volumes, and I'll just take a moment to just kind of talk through those sections. Uh, the introduction contains a lot of good information on the city and our budgeting process. The financial summaries behind that tab, you'll, it provides an overview of the budget figures and looks at how we are projecting our revenues and expenses. The departmental budgets provide information on funding and positions in each department. Our second volume contains performance data on every department, including the issues departments are facing, along with the strategies and results they are using to track their progress in those areas. The fund summary section is the official budget, if you will. As I mentioned, this summary by fund, department, and account class is the official budget that will be voted on in June. But we don't believe that this section alone provides you with enough information about the budget. We've included the additional sections to provide a more comprehensive view of the budget. The capital budget provides an overview of the capital activity in the coming year. And finally, the appendix provides some reference materials such as the city's financial policies and our table of compliance uh, where we go over each of the operating funds and review how we are doing with regard to the level of unbudgeted reserve and contingency we have. And as I mentioned, the budget is available on okc.gov backslash budget. Uh, you can uh, view the document there. And so uh, with that, that's kind of a, a brief overview of our um, uh, budget and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have or uh, and again we'll, we'll I'll be available at each of the meetings uh, as we go forward in case other questions should come up. Thank you Doug. Appreciate Doug? the overview. Count, I have a question, two questions. Can you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. First um, 
the comment period you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. on the okc.gov backslash budget, I don't see the, um, the link for folk to submit their comments online. Is, is that available yet? Uh, my uh, it's to be turned on today. We have it ready. And so if it's not on now, it should be very shortly. Uh, we will have it on before, before lunchtime. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then just a point of clarification on the task force items and specifically the mental health alternative that was one of the six proposals we put forward. If I'm looking at that correctly, it looks like $300,000 for the mental health component and then a million for like whatever else comes from those other five items and the task force slash the human rights commission. And am I reading that right? It looks like a total of 1.3. Correct. So we have 1.3 million again for mental health, uh, <clears throat> community policing and homelessness, those recommendations. Um, uh, that's available in non-departmental to be allocated to those various recommendations. Okay. Um, that's promising to me, just knowing that the Denver Star program, which is a similar mental health one, began with 200,000. So I'm, I'm gonna be following this very, very closely. And I just wanna say to everybody who's watching this, that work continues. Um, and the comment section I just referenced, like, that consultant 21 CP is still doing that research. The 12 member working group of our uh, community policing um, resolution, they're still doing their work. And so I would encourage residents to reach out to voices of OKC at 21cpsolutions.com and continue to add your voice to that conversation because th these funds um, that we just described are a placeholder until those final recommendations come to us. And so those final recommendations are still based on research that 21CP and that working group will be doing, and they're based on community input. And so I just really wanna highlight that this work is ongoing, and that's really all I'm gonna have to say for a while. But I just wanna say thank you for, for everyone for that. Well, more work ahead of us, but we're, we're heading somewhere. And while we're on that subject, um, Mr. Doug, will you uh, actually talk about that human rights uh, portion of this? Because it is not listed. So I just want to make sure but that we uh, understand it because it is. I did not see it. Right. So that is in the non-departmental section okay. of, of our budget. Uh, that's where we do things that really don't fit in one department. They kind of go across the city. And we put it there because we weren't just uh, sure yet exactly whether that was what was going to be for police, what was going to be for homelessness, and whether some of that mental health uh, response might be something uh, either, you know, in police or outside of police. It may function. We, we just aren't, haven't, it hasn't been defined yet how that would function. So we wanted to kind of keep that open-ended uh, in non-departmental and make that available. I just wanted to make sure we verbalize again that there is money that will be reserved for the Human Rights uh, Commission dependent upon uh, what the uh, task force decides as far as those recommendations to the council. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Doug, I appreciate that. Next up we have our um, fire chief, uh, Richard Kelly to present the fire department budget. Good morning, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen real quick. Can you see that okay? Yes, sir. Yes. Excellent, thank you very much. Good morning, Mayor and Council. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm honored to be your fire chief. I'm Richard Kelly. And today I have with me Clint Regeer, our business manager, and I'd really like to thank Clint for his efforts in preparing this budget and all the work that he does uh, assisting me every day. We're really excited to come to you today and share our vision of building a premier fire department. And if you would like to follow along, along with us on page C3, C53, 
of the budget book, you can uh, follow along in that area. The mission state statement of the Oklahoma City Fire Department is to provide emergency response, fire prevention, and public education services to the Oklahoma City community so they can have their lives and property protected. Our official uh, mission statement is to respond quickly, safely, courteously, meet the need, and our firefighters do that every day, and we're very proud of what they do, and we're very proud of the community that we do serve. Here is a, a quick breakdown of our organizational chart. If you'll notice in our budget this year for FY22 that we have 999 uniform positions and 40 civilian positions for a total of 1,039. There are three divisions, major divisions within the fire department and also our administrative services. Our operational services is headed up by Deputy Chief Mike Walker and I'll show uh, him later within our presentation. Underneath Chief Walker, he has two major lines of business, and that's our fire suppression operations and our emergency medical services. Our support services are headed by Deputy Chief Tony Davis, and he has two major areas or lines of business within the budget, and that's fire department dispatch and our human resources work section, as well as our fire logistics and facilities maintenance work section. And then our fire prevention services headed by Deputy Chief Harold Thompson, and he, have three, he has three lines of business, and that's fire investigations, fire code compliance, and public safety. And then we have our administrative services where we have our executive leadership and our public relations and marketing. I wanted to give you a, a quick overview of the city so you could see where your services are every day for, from your fire department. We currently have 37 stations that are in service. You actually will note that station 38 is listed there on Southwest 59th in Richland. Uh, we're hoping to be completed with that project in 2022. With all, with all 38 fire stations, there are 39 engine companies, 13 ladder companies, 17 brush pumpers, six battalion chiefs, six heavy tankers, four light rescues. And then we have a hazmat unit, a rescue unit, and a water rescue unit. And you can see the services provided throughout the city. On our expenditures and, uh, and positions by fund, you can see there in the general fund this year, we have 826 positions for 110 million. In the fire sales tax, we have 213 positions for 47 million. And then our MAPS 3, MAPS 4, and Better Streets and Safe for City Use Funds, we have 700,000 in the use tax. And then the MAPS 4 use tax fund, we have 9.2 million. And then the Better Streets uh, Safer City Use Tax Fund, we have 10.5 million. So you can see a, a total overall budget of 166 million. That is up from our FY21 budget of 160 uh, million. And that's an increase of two positions. You also note that there's quite a bit of funds there in the Use Tax Fund that's primarily used for our apparatus replacement. We have purchased six aerial ladders that we are putting in service and that is not showing yet uh, out of that fund. So that's why we have such a large amount there at this time. Getting into our major budget changes for FY22, we do have changes in personnel related costs at 2.1 million. And that includes all our step increases and our insurance roll up. And then we are restoring the 21 grant fund, uh, I'm sorry, general fund frozen positions for station 38 at 2.1 million. And we're restoring overtime funding in the general fund. And this was an area that we reduced last year in our salary reserve that actually is our FLSA overtime, that in that area, we reduced that spending. And that was how, how we reduced it was taking our apparatus out of service. And when we did that, we took our brush pumpers out of service primarily. And restoring this general fund will allow us to do callback so we can uh, minimize those apparatus being placed out of service. We're also re restoring our recruit overage program and our fire sales tax of 438,000. We're restoring our defibrillator replacement fund and fire sales tax of 650,000. We're restoring overtime funding in the fire sales tax. That's just a reflection of the same for the general fund funding of overtime. We're restoring that in the fire sales tax side of 228,000. 
and we're restoring funding for building maintenance and repairs and new construction uh, or improvements in our fire sales tax of 1.9 million. And as Doug mentioned earlier, we're really excited about the addition of a business intelligence analyst, and that will really allow us to, to drill down and look at our data and make sure that we're uh, making informed decision makings, uh, informed decisions to serve the community. So we're really excited about that opportunity. And we're also looking at adding a digital media producer, uh, which would uh, assist with our public relations and marketing with the community and our residents and visitors, but also with our personnel. Um, we do train every day, a minimum of two hours, and that's a requirement of our ISO, Insurance Services Organization. So a lot of times with the size of the city and how we train, we do use some distance learning and videos become a big portion of that. So we're really excited about that new position to add that capability. We will talk about some of our strategic results through the fire department. Primary on our strategic results annually, the residents of Oklahoma City, even anticipating growth in outlying areas, will receive emergency medical response within seven minutes, 70% of the time, in order to protect the lives, assess and treat emergency medical emergencies and limit damage to property and the environment. As you can see this year, our FY21 estimate in that we're estimating that would be about 60%. So we're slightly below uh, our 70% goal. And over the last five years, you've seen us trending and staying about 65%. You will note a marked increase in our call volume last year. And we've been looking at that. A lot of that is attributed to some of the weather related events we've had. We also, at the end of the year, we've seen an increased spike in our medical emergencies, probably uh, related to some of the COVID events. And we're drilling down to see that that number has decreased by about 5%. And a lot of that comes about is the call volume and the weather related arena, but also due to the increased spike in medical related emergencies where we're, that's uh, caused undue demand on the fire department as well as IMSA. So we are drilling down to that to, uh, to look and see what we can do to improve that area. Our next strategic result we have is annually, the structure fire fatality rate in Oklahoma City will be at or below the national average of 1.05 per 100,000 residents. And when you look at that number, it's less than seven fatalities. And that's based on the latest data available from the National Fire Protection Association. So we look at that data every year. And you can see that our, our estimate this year, where we're at currently would be five fatalities. We obviously, our goal, we would like to have zero, but being less than the, the seven fatalities, we want to continually monitor that and make sure we're doing everything we can to, to reduce that number. So we're gonna continually evaluate that. You notice in 2018, that was the year we had a significant increase in fire fatalities. A majority of those were attributed to uh, vacant structures where we had some uh, multiple fatalities in vacant structures. And we also noted in those, the majority of those were without a working smoke alarm. So we wanna assure, uh, make sure that all of our residents within the city are still receiving a, a free smoke alarm if they do not have one. And we're still providing that service and they can call 316 BEEP. That's 316 BEEP to uh, actually receive a free smoke alarm. And we'll come out and put that up to code and assure that they have one within, a, within their residence. So that's the way we wanna work in our community risk reduction to reduce that strategic result. I'd like to get into our fire lines of business now. This is one of our new rescue units that we have received here. The first one I'll get into is our fire administration. And before I get into, I want to explain just a real quick number. As you'll notice in some of these uh, position numbers, they'll be like 34.05. And that 0.05 is how we allocate our personnel resources between programs. I just wanted to provide that information up front. In our fire administration, we're looking at two lines of business and that's our executive so they can achieve strategic goals and key results. And in that budget, we have 12.2 million in 34 positions. Our public relations and marketing provides informational, educational, and promotional services to residents, the media, and the business community, and departmental personnel. 
We have four positions there at 485,000. You'll see here, it, it, this is a picture of Deputy Chief Mike Walker. He is our Deputy Chief of Operations. He is over the largest division within our department. And under operations, you see that we have two areas in our uh, lines of service here, our emergency medical services and our fire suppression operations. This is broken down in, in between the two. It's actually split 70 to 30%, and that's based on our call volume. So 70% of our call volume basically is emergency medical services, and 30% would be our fire suppression operations, and that's why it's broke down in the budget. And our proposed budget in, in 22, under emergency medical services, this area is designed to provide response of life-threatening emergencies and medical assistance services to residents and visitors uh, in Oklahoma City so they can receive immediate medical assessment and treatment that will improve, resolve, or stabilize their condition. We have 88 million in that, uh, in that area, is 636 positions. And our fire suppression operation provides fire protection emergency response services to our residents so they can utilize, so they can realize minimalized property loss, reduced injuries and fatalities. We have 285 positions there in our budget and we have 38 point million to cover that. I would like to highlight one area. We're extremely excited about this opportunity on May 8th of this year, we're gonna to go to full advanced life support implementation of all 37 fire stations. This has been a program that we actually started in 1998. So it, it will be exciting to see that come to fruition uh, we have three stations that we'll be putting in service that day. So at that time, all 37 fire stations will be able to provide advanced life support on their engine company or brush pumper. Our support services is Deputy Chief Tony Davis. Chief Davis is going to retire on June 1st. Uh, we really thank Chief Davis for his leadership and opportunities that he's created throughout our organization to see people improve and grow and He'll be definitely missed um, and we wish him well. We have already replaced him with an appointee and that's Deputy Chief Shane Smiley and we're excited to see him come on board as he brings a lot to with the leadership and capability in that position. Under support services in the budget this year, we have fire dispatch and logistics facilities and maintenance. Uh, fire dispatch provides coordinated response services to residents and visitors in need so they can receive immediate and appropriate emergency and non-emergency assistance. In that, we have 2.1 million and 14 positions. And our logistics and facilities maintenance is the area we actually take care of all of our fire apparatus, all of our fleet, and take care of that with our own internal fire mechanics. And we also take care of our facilities working with general services. Uh, we provide uh, this area provides fleet equipment and facilities to service the Oklahoma City Fire Department so it can have safe and reliable facilities and equipment to respond. We have 20 positions there at 9.6 million. And this is a re uh, rendering of Fire Station 38 at Southwest 59th and Richland Road. We have uh, just began to, to break ground there. We hopefully we can uh, here shortly we can have a groundbreaking ceremony but we're really excited to see this come out of the ground we uh we would look to see this completed in sometime in 2022 hopefully early 2022 and this will actually house an engine a, a brush pumper and a tanker our fire project fire prevention services is deputy chief harold thompson he is our fire marshal and Chief Thompson brings a lot of excitement and exuberance to that uh, position and with a, a long history of uh, code compliance and history within fire prevention services. In fire prevention, we have three uh, different sections on the, that we're looking at, code compliance, fire investigations, and public safety education. In code compliance, we provide compliance through specialized inspections, testing, and consultation services to residents, property owners, and business owners and industry professionals so they can live in a safe and secure community. We have 2.7 million in that, in that uh, proposed budget for code compliance and 19 positions. Fire investigations provides investigation services to prosecutors, property owners, and property insurers. We have 14 positions there at 2.2 million. 
and our fire public safety education provides community risk reduction activities to the community of Oklahoma City so they can prevent and better prepare for emergencies. And we have 10 positions there at 1.4 million. And a highlight in fire prevention services is our compliance program. And this is, we've collaborated with the compliance provider to ensure regular fire protection system testing and repairs on all fire protection systems installed in buildings throughout the Oklahoma City Metro. Over the last seven months, fire has been able to identify 1,200 new premises with fire protection systems that have been added to our database. And that allows us to assure every year that they're properly inspected and updated to make sure we have a safe and secure community. We do have some goals that we would like to accomplish in 2022. First and foremost, we wanna work with IMSA to develop an EMS transport contingency plan. We're co consistently meeting with them and trying to work on improvement uh, opportunities and how we provide better service to our residents. Want to integrate processes within our new record management system to include areas such as burn permits, smoke alarm installations, and inventory. We really want to be able to drill down when we have a structure fire somewhere to identify if we put the smoke alarm in that residence or if it was put in by someone else. We want to be able to drill down in that area. We want to identify all high-risk properties with life safety systems. We want to improve our wildland urban interface incident response and how we deal with wildland urban interface in, the, in our city. We're going to continually train and integrate and, dat and look at data retrieval systems and analysis from our newly implemented record management system to enhance our fire department ability to collect and analyze our data. We wanna implement mobile hardware and software technologies capable of capturing the incident data from remote locations to more efficiently gather that data. And as always, we'll continue to meet our mission of respond quickly, safely, courteously meet the need. I really appreciate uh, the leadership over this last year of of uh, council and mayor. I know it's been a very difficult year with uh, everything that we've been dealing with in COVID. And, and I, I would just like to thank you for your leadership. I know it, uh, protecting the community also protects our firefighters and allows us to better serve our community. So thank you very much for that. And at this time, I will entertain any questions. Chief Mark Stone Cipher here. Um, thank yes, you for your pre presentation. You did a really good job. It was very you, helpful. And I think the one thing that, that we forget about and we need to emphasize over and over again is the fine job our fire department does. In fact, in our last citizens survey, you had almost a 90% approval rating and uh, my hat's off to you for a great job. And I also think it's really important and you should be commended for 65% um, usually, last year was an anomaly, but 65% of our response times are in less than seven minutes and you have a goal to get to, to 70%. And so I really wanna commend you for that. But what I, what I want you to focus on for a second and help us with in the uh, major budget changes, uh, there, were, there are nine different items and uh, two through seven really jump out at me. And I know you put, uh, you displayed some of this information but could you tell everybody the importance to the department it means to restore the frozen 21 budgeted positions, to restore salary reserves, to restore uh, recruit overage funding. What does that mean to our department and how will that make our department better? Yes, sir. Thanks, sir, for asking. And uh, thank you for those uh, kind words. I know our firefighters really appreciate that and appreciate your support in that, uh, Councilman. When you look at the uh, major budget changes um, in that on, uh, the 21 frozen positions, that is extremely important because that is our personnel that we actually have assigned to the new fire station, fire station 38. Now, obviously, we look at contingency plans and we would be able to open that station no matter what. But as you do that, now you shift resources around in the city. This gives us an opportunity to stay focused where we're at today and be able to add those positions for that new fire station. So that's extremely important, especially servicing that area in southwest Oklahoma City. So that's, a, that's an important of those 21 positions. When you look at the uh, restoring the overtime, throughout the year, what we did last year, in, in order to meet our, our budgeted challenges, instead of calling back and covering some certain days when we were short on staffing, we would actually put a, you know, some of our apparatus out of service. Now, when we do that, 
we always focus and look at the risk and make sure what the weather conditions are and the challenges that we have there. So we, we definitely drill down in that and look at every part of that. But anytime that if we have an apparatus and it's in service for a reason, we would like to keep it that way. So those restoring that overtime is very important in those to minimize those ap- ap- apparatus being placed out of service. So that's extremely important in that area. When we look at our overaging pro- overage program, that's something that we do in our fire sales tax. And that allows us to not get too low on our staffing. We're actually, uh, actually allows us to stay a little bit above our staffing. So as we have retirements and we have that, we don't see a lull in our resources and, and the staffing that we have. So that overage program that we use for our fire sales tax that allows us to really uh, be prepared and stay above retirements and, and take care of that. So those are areas that are really important as far as resources to the community and, and why those major budget changes are extremely important. I hope that answered your question, Councilman. Thank you very much. That was quite helpful. Thank you, sir. Chief Todd Stone, I, I have a quick question. Uh, yes, how sir. Many, how many classes do you think we will have in the next year? Great question, sir. Uh, we are, I know at least one large class that we're looking at having in the fall. We're actually in the process right now. I'm really pushing our support services and they're working very hard uh, to get us a good quality class and diverse class. And we hope to start one uh, September, October, and we'll look at our retirements. And, and after that, we, we're looking at probably a larger class at that time, sir. And then we'll look at from retirements. And usually we see our retirements earlier in the year Usually by July 1st, we see the majority of our retirements by that time. So we'll be able to calculate that and see exactly where we go after that, sir. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate you and, and everything that your, your staff and all the firefighters do. Uh, great job. And I especially love the program with the uh, smoke alarms that you guys give away for free if needed. And uh, I'm really excited to see that you guys are going to be able to dive into that data uh, to see the true impact of that. Cause I, I honestly, I think it'll be huge. So yes, thank sir. you. Yes, sir. Thanks for your support. Chief. All right. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> yes, sir. Captain Cooper. First is thank you for, for the presentation. And of course the, the work are, um, firefighters do on a daily basis. I was just wondering, the item that stands out the most to me is the um, emergency um, management um, side of things, uh, emergency services rather. Could you speak a little bit more about what we've learned in this pandemic um, as it relates to those uh, services and um, what we see going forward. So I know you said, we, and by, I mean like the emergency management, uh, sorry, excuse me, emergency medical services. I know that we've spoken a lot over the last year about uh, some of the pressures the pandemic has put on you and your folk. And I'm just, and I know you also said during your presentation that there's still some stuff we're learning, but could you kind of walk us through what our experiences have been again? So people, uh, are able to refamiliarize themselves with that and just some idea of what we're thinking going forward, please? Yes, sir. It, it's kind of interesting as we tracked data, you know, starting last March in, in 2020 in April, and it's moving forward about the April and the next three months, we've seen a, a pretty significant decrease in our call volume, about 30%. The majority of that would be medical related emergencies. And, and as you look at the numbers, our estimate we're seeing this year, you know, is going to be about 7,000 calls above last year. So what we've seen through the pandemic is at the end of the year, we've really seen a marked increase in our call volume. And what we noticed with some of the changes in leadership, and when I say that, you know, the changeover of how IMSA is, is managing their, their uh, organization, that we really have an opportunity to work together. And uh, so we're really focusing, how do we sit down with them? And, and the main focus is how do we provide the best service to our community? So it's really important for us to sit down at the table with them and learn and see how do we make sure our services are working hand in hand? 
and that's what our focus is now. We, we see changes that we're working through. We have the IMSA Talk Medic program that was approved through council uh, uh, about a month ago. So we're seeing how do we figure out services of working together instead of two different organizations basically working parallel. We want to be two organizations working together hand in hand. And we've always have a great relationship. We have uh, the same medical director, but I think the pandemic really showed us that we need even to work harder at that collaborative effort. So that, I hope that answered your question, but we're really just setting down. We meet on a regular basis. We drill into how can we provide a better service and how do we come up with contingency plans? We want to make sure if something happens that we don't have any stop, any gaps that we're, you know, we're missing. Thank you. Are we experiencing still the, um, the really high um, kind of like, it was almost like there was a backlog that was happening when people were um, finding themselves in need of uh, hospital services and getting to um, the hospital during the pandemic. Um, do we know, you mentioned a, d a decrease, but then there was an increase just a little bit ago in some of your comments, like where are we at with some of those um, situations? When we looked at our data over the last couple months, obviously February was extremely busy, but that was weather related. Since that time, we've kind of stabilized and, and gone back to what we would consider normal. Um, it, we're still every every year we see a slight tick uh, increase in calls. So we are still seeing that that we see every year, but it seems like everything's starting to stabilize and come back to what we consider normal operations. And then finally, it sounds like, and help, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like a lot of the services you all are doing, um, like year after year, there seems to be a bit more of an increase in that medical side of things. Do, do we have any explanation on why that might be? Majority of time, what we see is an increase in population, an aging population. You know, you see a variety of factors there, uh, health conditions. Uh, one thing that we want to do, and we've, we've done a community risk assessment, but we want to get down and, and really drill down more in that is identify those type of uh, issues you're talking about. How do we, and then how do we educate the public in that? You know, we've always been very good at fire safety education. We really focus now on injury prevention. But one area that we want to improve and grow upon is, you know, our, our medical side of that. How do we help people to, to live healthier and to be, you know, to, to continue to have healthy lifestyles because that ultimately does affect our services. And, you know, so we have to learn from that. We also look at, you know, it's becoming more involved of, you know, people calling 911 for different reasons. So we try to, uh, we have a program called our, our community advocacy program, where we actually look at uh, residents that call on a more frequent basis. And we actually have one of our paramedics that we reach out to them and we, we try to identify the reasoning behind that. We know that there's systemic reasons behind that, maybe that they're not working with their doctor, they're not taking their medication. Uh, we found out many times they just need a ramp built to their house, or maybe they need a lift chair in their in their house to help them up and down. So we have that community advocacy program that we want to identify and drill down to try to reduce that call volume in some of those areas as well. So we're continually trying to identify methods to work with our community to reduce that need to call 911. Wow, that was very helpful context. Thank you so much. And again, uh, I really appreciate um, the commendable work you all do every day. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. We have great firefighters that love serving this community. So thank you, sir. Chief Kelly, I have a couple of questions. And uh, first, thank you all for your service as well. Um, I know, especially during this past year, it has been a trying time for you all. Um, and, and the folks who serve at each station every day. So I, I do wanna say thank you to all of our firefighters for their service and personnel uh, that are not necessarily firefighters, but serve you all in that capacity. As we look at the business intelligent analyst and this digital media producer, are these gonna be internal or external uh, hires as far as uh, who can apply for these positions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, right now we're working with, uh, we'll be working with city HR. I mean, usually we like to open that up 
we want to try to find the best person and fit for those positions. So we'll be working with city HR on those to see what, what is available in that. But we're just now in that beginning stages of getting everything together. So I, I, since it's a civilian position, you know, we'll be working with city HR, but I would believe that would probably be open uh, to internal and to external. And who's been doing your media, social media platform now? Because I, I do want to commend whoever is doing that. So I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm a little nervous because it's like, you need somebody else? Because whoever is doing <laughs> this is really great. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate that. That's Chief Benny Fulkerson and Major Lou Marshick. And it, it's actually in within uh, Chief Fulkerson's work section. It's just in the past, we've had a uniform position that did more of the digital media side of it. And, you know, um, we had a person that moved on to greener pastures and uh, had a great opportunity to move to another position. But it's difficult to find firefighters that have that, you know, that skill set. And we wanted to get that where it's a continuous person that that's what they're trained and that's their experience and, and background. And so that person is going to move in and assist Chief Fulkerson. We're, we're not moving Chief Fulkerson anywhere and his staff. We're just going to add to that and just give that capability uh, to the, to him and his staff. Okay, great. And um, I also wanted to touch on the budgeted positions because I, I heard you say you wanted to look at making sure these positions are diverse. So I just wanted to know what that uh, commitment looks like uh, for the future class. And, and also, um, how did we do with this last class? Yes, ma'am. We have uh, 29 individuals that are about to retire and I can get you that breakdown. I actually have it coming to me and, and I can get that to you. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have it right here in front of me. I, I apologize for that. But uh, the, we have a recruitment work section that works very hard in uh, diversity and inclusion and really focusing in that area. They're basically taking over in, a, in our hiring process. They were very instrumental in our current hiring process. I haven't got an update on the breakdown yet on the what's made it past this last step. And the, the last step is our CPAT. That's our candidate physical agility test. And we just finished that. So usually once I finish that, I'll get a full breakdown of that. And I can also provide that to you as well. Um, but, you know, again, we're focusing, you know, inner city, uh, you know, trying to uh, reach out to college professionals, different people that our recruitment staff is working very hard to assure that we meet uh, the community and try to reflect the community that we serve. Thank you for that commitment. And my last question, um, especially just kind of hearing you talk about this community advocacy program, how can we relate that program to maybe the uh, program that we have for our students as far as the fire, um, just that introduction to, to fire and, and the careers that it could, could hold um, and listening at the idea of advocacy where we can start putting our youth in these types of, of working positions of advocating for their neighbors and creating that kind of relationship pertaining to, to fire and, and for them to really understand how that works with that that neighborhood fire uh, relationship that I know we would really like to see in a lot of our communities. Not to say it's not happening now, but um, just for our students to be a, a part of that that commitment in that process. All right. Yes, ma'am. I know. You know, we are very focused, community oriented in all of our firehouses. We want to be involved. You know, at schools and in different areas. The the community advocacy program is more focused on those uh, individuals that call 911 that have, you know, health issues or certain uh, triggers that they may be uh, utilizing that service. And we're trying to redirect that and assist them in, in meeting their needs besides, you know, uh, just a fire engine showing up and just doing the acute uh, treatment. We want to look at long term and how do we take care of them. So it's a little bit different. Uh, I, I hope I'm answering your question. Then the student involvement, you know, the student involvement is where we believe uh, not only recruiting, but everything that we do is on a individual basis. We have to get all of our firefighters on the same page. So it's important that every firefighter at every firehouse is involved in their community. This last year was very difficult for us because we like to be involved in the community and that's kind of been pulled back. Um, so hopefully as we move forward to give us an opportunity to, 
to refresh, refocus, and be more engaged in the community at the, especially the school levels. And that also is our recruitment program to get the students involved, you know, with the Metro Tech program and different programs throughout the city to engage them in the fire service. Okay. I hope that, I answered your question there. Yes and no, but that's something we can <laughs> talk about a little later. Just yes, throwing some ideas out there, but that, I mean, it's not complicated for us to talk about it a little later, but I appreciate the answer. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Chief Kelly. Council yes, ma'am. Can you speak for a second about the status of the Fire Explorer program? That might speak to what Councilwoman Nice was referring to um, involving youth and, and students. Right. That's great. Thank you for bringing that up. I apologize. I did not. Um, we do have a fire explorer program that's ran by several of our firefighters and we focus. It, it is part of the Boy Scouts. And I know when you hear that term, it is it is um, it's not gender specific. We do have male and female explorers. And I believe it's from the age of 13 to 21. And uh, we meet uh, every other Tuesday at our fire training center. Uh, we are very involved in, uh, you know, we, we really focus on obviously the inner city, but it is a Boy Scout program. So we have a lot of uh, different individuals from around the metro. But that is one area that we're really involved with, we're really excited about. Uh, even, though, even through the challenges of COVID, we've been able to stay together. I know they did a lot of Zoom and, and different distance learning and now getting back together. So that's a great program that if anyone is interested, you can direct them to call the fire department. We can uh, connect them with that. It's a great program to teach uh, individuals about leadership, not just about being a firefighter, but just how to be involved in your community. So thank you for bringing that up, uh, Councilwoman Young. That's a great area that, you know, might be a, someone could plug someone into the fire service and not just the fire services, how to be involved in their community. And thank you. I didn't know, uh, remember the name of the program, but that's the program that I was actually talking about because of <laughs> you actually mentioning the piece of community, that's, that's where I was asking, is there a possibility to bridge um, just the understanding and knowledge of intergenerational connection? That's, that's what I'm talking about. And I understand people are frequently calling 911. So in some aspects, a, uh, a young mentee or community folk, young person wanting to be engaged in fire and community would be able to also just check on this neighbor, say this, you know, as far as just creating that connection, that's what actually what I was referring to. So that, but again, we, you, we can talk about it a little later, but that's just something I wanna hopefully uh, get your, your thoughts thinking on that, if there's a way that that could happen. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you, Councilwoman Young. That is the program I was referring to. Sure. Yeah, it's a good program. I came up through the search and rescue explorers out of Baptist, was how I was familiar with the fire post. And um, if it's anything today like it was then, it's an excellent program. And I hope that we continue to grow that. Thank you for everything that you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Thanks for your assistance. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chief. Appreciate that. Appreciate the presentation. Next up, we have our courts director, municipal courts director, LaShawn Thompson, to present the municipal courts budget. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, Mayor and Council. LaShawn Thompson here to present the FY22 proposed budget. Um, if you would like to follow my budget, you can find that it's located in the budget book on C105. Here's our department overview. We have 62 positions in municipal court, uh, four municipal judges that are appointed by council. There are five lines of business in municipal court that share the responsibility of the operations. On an average, we dock it over 70 court sessions weekly. 
procedural justice. The mission of municipal court is to ensure procedural justice to court patrons affected by a violation of Oklahoma City ordinances so they can be assured of fairness, transparency, and impartiality in the timely disposition of all cases. We pride ourselves in municipal court by ensuring that the four principles of procedural justice are infused in the way we do business and how we treat our customers. Courts across America are being tasked with the importance of carrying out procedural justice and fairness in the process of the court. In order for our court patrons to trust the process, they must have confidence in the system. It's important that we are providing an opportunity for their voice to be heard, being transparent in our actions, being fair in the process, and being impartial in the decision-making. Next is our budget summary. Our proposed operating budget is $8.4 million. Our non-operating budget includes additional expenses that contribute to the cost of prosecution, which brings the department's total budget to 8.7 million, which is 3.5% below the FY21 budget. This slide represents the collection summary by the financial service program. In FY20, we collected $15.8 million. $15 million. The collection summary is broken into four main categories. Fines, which represents approximately 3.5% of the general fund, court costs, fees, and exterior maintenance fines. In FY20, municipal court disposed a little over 150,000 cases. And of those cases, 7,214 cases resulted in a finding of indigent. Our rule A hearing process um, is where we address defendants that don't have the financial ability to pay their fines and costs. We have 16 hearings scheduled weekly. The defendants are provided with a packet prior to the court date uh, and enclosed in that packet is a financial disclosure form and information to help them prepare for the hearing. At their hearing, we are reviewing their, we're, re we're reviewing their financial situation, money coming in, bills coming out, and the judge will make a determination whether or not the, uh, the defendant has the financial ability to pay their fines and costs. Uh, at that time, we make referrals uh, for services if uh, there are some services that are identified. In municipal court, we do not issue warrants for money owed. Uh, the only warrants we issue is for missed court dates only. Uh, in FY21, we suspended two point two million dollars as a result of individuals not being able to pay their fines and costs. Our major budget changes this year. Next I would like to discuss our budget changes. We're going to be adding, if approved, two positions to the court administration uh, division. Uh, our first position is a court officer. In FY21, we eliminated two court officers positions from enforcement and compliance division. However, this, this position will be assigned to the community outreach program, which allows us to expand our services we offer to our justice involved defendants. We're, at, we're, we're seeking to add a management specialist. The position will be responsible for providing purchasing oversight, supervising administrative support staff, contract administration, LFR and program improvements. Financial services. We're proposing to add a municipal count in one position to financial services to ensure that we have a viable succession plan and provide adequate coverage for the financial services division. Adding this position will help to develop talent in the department with the objective of replacing important leadership positions in the future. The senior customer service position will be restoring a position that was eliminated in the FY21 budget. Next, I would like to highlight a couple of our issues identified in our strategic business plan and our process to achieve those desired results. In 2018, we contracted with the Center for Court Innovation to train all of our municipal court staff over the concept of procedural justice. The training provided an in-depth overview of of the concept of procedural justice and the role that our employees play in carrying out this in carrying out the principles. The training was recorded and is a requirement for all new employees. In addition to the procedural justice 
procedural justice training, all leads, supervisors, and managers are required to complete a minimum of eight hours of professional development. We are constantly rolling out training modules, judicial orders, and updates through Power DMS to, show that, to ensure that our staff are provided with the most updated information. This slide shows how our customers have graded our experience in municipal court. In January of 2017, we implemented our municipal court customer satisfaction survey. This graph represents our progress in areas of customer satisfaction. Our, our customers should feel confident in the court process, regardless of the outcome of their case. FY22, 22 year to date, 98% of the people who completed our survey rated their customer experience as satisfied with a rating of four or better. As noted in the graph, our survey results have improved, improved in the midst of justice concerns being seen across America while navigating in a pandemic. Our customers indicated that they felt safe conducting their business in municipal court. Due to COVID-19, we implemented several protocols to ensure the safety of our customers and employees. The survey link is available online and printed at the bottom of all the receipts. Our survey, our survey results are used to assist us with identifying areas of enhancement, training, mentoring, coaching techniques, and also our employees are recognized for their outstanding customer service. This survey question was pulled out of the customer satisfaction survey to highlight the performance of the work of the municipal court staff. Here are the here we are looking at the customer's perception if they felt like they were treated with courtesy and respect by our court staff. I'm, ex I'm especially pleased with my staff this year and their ability to improve their customer service ratings while being faced with so many challenges in our business and our and operation. They have embraced all of the required COVID-19 protocols while making sure they continue to provide excellent customer service. Even with providing contactless service, they have been still successful at meeting the needs of our customers. Community Outreach Program. We launched our Community Outreach Program in July of 2018. The success of this program has been beneficial to our court system. The program has been instrumental in assisting defendants in our court and other jurisdictions and agencies. The program monitors the daily court the daily inmate count and provides a daily report over our inmate population. We're currently averaging about six inmates per day. Due to a standing temporary judicial only order, the only defendants that are jailed are defendants charged with the substance, abu substance abuse related arrests. All of our Oklahoma City inmates are automatically given a 10 hour or a bond on all municipal charges. All public intox arrests are identified and sent to Oklahoma City Police Department, Nick Elias, for compliance review. The program ensures the timely release of all city inmates from the Oklahoma County Detention Center. We collaborate with the Oklahoma City Police Department jail staff to, to ensure that all or our bonds are processed in a timely manner. We offer services for defendants to visit about their case in advance or when leaving court to ask all of the pertinent questions. Our court liaisons are called upon by the judges when a defendant needs further explanation about a court process or assistance with filling out court forms or plea statements. This, the program has been able to reduce the number of warrants issued and the fears of going to jail. We partnered with the Diversion Hub, the Homeless Alliance, North Care, Remerge, the City Rescue Mission, Team, the Department of Corrections, Federal Bureau of Prisons, Oklahoma, Oklahoma County and other agencies to address outstanding warrants. Often inmates are not allowed to participate in drug court and to be released from prison or transferred to a lower level of care without, out, without with outstanding warrants. This program is responsible for handling all inmate correspondence and collaborating with the municipal counselor's office to address those outstanding issues. The number of Oklahoma City municipal warrants issued. This graph represents the number of Oklahoma City warrants that have been issued since FY16. This graph rep represents that fewer warrants are being issued, which we believe 
because we have shifted our focus on compliance rather than enforcement. Compliance strategies. We implemented a 14 day grace period to allow defendants the, ex the extra time they need when they fail to take action on by their arraignment date. The case is placed in a holding status and a post court reminder is sent. During this period, no warrant is issued, the fine doesn't increase, and it allows the defendant to, the, to address the citation without returning the court. During the pandemic, we implemented a calling program to keep our, our customers updated on the status of their cases. Customers are contacted to remind them of their future court dates as well. We implemented our first virtual court hearing last month for individuals that were not comfortable with attending court in person. All probation interviews are conducted virtually. Defendants are given 90 days to pay their fines and costs after entering, entering a plea, and defendants are allowed to have one warrant recall in a case without having to post bond. Our community outreach staff is available to assist defendants with completing forms if they need help. We offer our daily Rule 8 hearings, and in July of 2021, we will launch our first evening traffic and criminal arraignment docket at 6 p.m. to offer another services for individuals that are not able to attend court during traditional hours. Next, I would like to highlight some of the department's successful outcomes. We pride ourselves as being trailblazers when it comes to the area of criminal justice reform. Reducing the jail population, we all continue to work together to reduce our population by implementing different programs and judicial orders. We continue to expand our community outreach program by offering additional services to ensure that defendants are better informed about the processes and the options available in our court. We continue to identify ways to, to deliver excellent customer service. We initiated our penalty reduction program in July of 2019, and we have closed 3,131 cases, dismissed 1,108 failure to appear cases with a collection value of 482,000. Due to the support of council, the program was extended. Our adult probation department has a 92% compliance rate with a 7% recidivism rate. 95% of all of the juveniles that are placed on probation complete their requirements successfully. We launched our first homeless court in October of 2020 to assist individuals that are experiencing homelessness to address their outstanding obligations, which can often create barriers to, sec to secure stable housing. We held our first successful virtual court last month, and we also offer on-site probation interviews virtual probation interviews where the defendant can meet with their probation officer in a safe environment. We continue to work with CJAC and support the recommendations and the initiatives to improve our court systems in Oklahoma County. We have done some amazing work in the area of criminal justice reform. However, none of this would be possible without the support of mayor and council. With the guidance and assistance from our presiding judge, Philippa James, deputy municipal counselor, Cindy Richard, and the police chief and his staff, we have all worked jointly to identify and improve our processes and decrease our daily inmate population and improve our, and improve our jail bookings and release process. Our collaboration remains the cornerstone of our success. Ensuring justice. This has been a difficult year with navigating without a playbook. We had to close briefly to prepare and respond to the pandemic in order to reopen, we knew we had to identify and implement COVID-19 protocols to ensure that we would be able to keep our employees and customers safe. This was no easy task, but we faced our challenges with grace and an enormous amount of patience. In addition to the people I've already mentioned, I would like to thank several departments for playing a key role in assisting us with reopening safely. None of this would, would have been possible without the support of the Judiciary Committee the city manager's office, Nick Kelly, risk management division, Christy Yeager, the public information and marketing department, Amy Madeira with human, human resources, and Shad Meldrum with information technology and all of their staff. Last but not least, I would like to thank my incredible staff at Municipal Court. We knew nothing about this virus and we were only dealing, we knew nothing about this virus. Not only were we, dealing with our own personal fears and concerns, we had to continue 
that we were ensuring justice. We all researched and worked together to identify the best practices to safely open our doors. We stretched our superpowers. And because of the great city team, we have reopened our doors and we are stronger, safer together. Mayor and Council, I would like to thank you for your unwavering support. And I would, I would be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. This is Mark Stone Cipher. Um, I want to thank you for a really fine presentation, but uh, a couple of things that stick out to me uh, to have a 90% approval rating by your court patrons that are satisfied with the experience is unbelievable. I've never heard of anything like that. And it's so important to me that we have that because many people, their only experience with Oklahoma City is when they come to your courthouse. And so to have that approval rating is just fantastic. And and, there, and looking at this last night, I noticed there's one thing you didn't mention, which I think is almost just as important. And that is when our court files, the court cases are actually audited. We have a 99% uh, approval that our records are updated and are accurate. And that's not only important to the system, that's important to the defendants, that's important to the lawyers, that's important to the legal assistants. And, and I commend you for that. Um, I know it was really difficult opening up, reopening during the pandemic. Uh, and uh, I know the challenges that you had with that, especially since it's not like you have the same people come in the building every day. And so you did a great job. I guess the one question I would have as a result of the court system closing down for a while, uh, do we have a backlog issue? Where are we at as far as cases and being caught up to date? Uh, thank you, Councilman Stone, sir, for a great question. We had a backlog and we have started to currently address our backlog and, and, and get those cases through the system. And um, last, I would just say that um, I, I know you took a little bit of a, a budget cut this year, but um, and I wish that wasn't happening because of all the great programs that that you have implemented, including uh, the, the program to monitor the jail population, the real aid hearing. Uh, the penalty reduction program, which take, has taken care of so many old tickets and warrants, uh, that's going to continue through the end of the year. Is that correct? Through the end of the fiscal year. That is correct. Okay. And, uh, and then how, about how much have we raised? 482000 Great job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councilman stone -Cyber. Hi, LaShawn. I just have a few questions. I really appreciate the presentation. And I think I've said this before about just all of your efforts on um, reforms and sort of rethinking um, how to help folks through the system. And I think particularly like the your emphasis on that compliance piece about being proactive about reminding people and, and, make, and getting people feeling less intimidated to participate in court services versus, you know, just kind of kicking the can down the line and trying to do enforcement later is is really impressive. Um, and I think that number of warrants really kind of really shows um, that kind of that kind of I, mindset. Um, I was curious on the the slide where you showed the like, I think it was around 15 something million in court collections. Mm -hmm. Where where do all those funds go are part of them towards municipal court operations? Or is it like you have to collect fees that then go to the state? Or how does that pie work? So that pie works, it, it's a combination. So court costs stay in municipal court to fund the, the, the cost of prosecution. The fines um, go to the general fund and I believe that was 3.5% of the fines contribute to the general funds. Um, then the exterior maintenance fines, that goes back to the development services division. And then we have some state mandated fees that go back to the state uh, that we collect in regards to the state statutes. Okay. Gotcha. Um, I had one other question and now I've lost it because I didn't write it down, which, oh no, there it is. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the, the additional core officer to community outreach and kind of what their work will be? And is it just adding another person to be able to kind of help the workload or will they kind of have a special focus or, or specialization, I suppose? Great question. So we're expanding the community outreach program. Um, we still have a lot of defendants that don't come to court with the necessary forms completed and filled out prior to the Rule 8 hearing. So we're going to designate a community, a, a court officer to the Rule 8 uh, uh, program to assist defendants with completing their paperwork 
getting their uh, required documents and getting them prepared for court. In addition to that, the court officer will be responsible for giving the presentation in our traffic and cr criminal arraignments and advising the, the defendants of the different options that they have available before the judge comes and takes the bench to start hearing the case. And, Cases again, another uh, another layer of helping our customers with being able to make an informed decision about their about their case, and then also we're going to launch our first evening court in July, and the court officer will assist in that evening court uh, docket also as well. Okay, great. I appreciate that. Um, that's really helpful. And just again, thank you for all the work you all do, and kind of the uh, way that you all have been really at the head and the forefront of of rethinking what our court systems can look like. So I appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Sean, um, first to echo what you're already hearing, um, I mean, hats off. If I were literally wearing a hat, I'd tip it to you. I'm just so proud of the work you're, you're doing. Um, so proud. Um, the virtual court possibility that we saw during the pandemic, I'm just thinking aloud here, is that at all something, um, or the probation aspect of it, is that at all something that is possible in a post pandemic world? I, I, I just think of barriers um, residents might, ex you know, from anxiety to, you know, a lack of a car, whatever it might be. Um, is that a possibility to consider going forward, the continuation of a virtual component to any of, uh, of the work? Great question, Councilperson Cooper. Um, the, the pandemic helped us open some, some, some doors. And so we are continuing to, we're gonna offer these same services outside of the pandemic um, because we feel like, like you said, it, it addressed those barriers. If you don't have a car to get to court or if you don't have the opportunity at your job to be able to come to you know, court, maybe you can you know, uh, visit with your probation officer on your lunch break or your break and things of that nature. So we're gonna to continue to offer these services post pandemic. Wow, uh, maybe it's cause I'm a pessimistic optimist by heart. I wasn't expecting that answer. That is wonderful. Um, that's really good news. Thank you for, for, for that. Um, my next one, um, could you help me better understand this warrant recall uh, like definition and what that process is? I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with what that. Okay. Great question. So let's say an individual has a court date and they miss their court. Um, a warrant is issued. And so prior to um, this reform uh, initiative, you would get a warrant and you would have to post bonds. So you would have to spend some additional funds before you could get a new court date. You would either have to uh, post a surety bond with the bondsman or pay the amount that uh, was set by the bond schedule. So now you're able to um, come to the docket counter and request for your case to be placed back on the, the, the docket that you had a warrant issue. So it saves the defendant some money uh, and then it allows them to address their case uh, by coming in themselves voluntarily without being arrested to get their case back on the original docket. Thank you. And my final uh, kind of thought here is my understanding um, you're serving on our uh, resolutions uh, working group, the 12 members, um, who, I'm, I'm right on that, right? The, com the community police working group, is that what you're referencing? Correct. Oh, yes, I am. Yeah, I was there that first day and I just so appreciated your introduction to the group and the context and perspective you brought to that conversation. Um, as we heard earlier, uh, we've set aside this 1.3 million for funding the various things, three being for the mental health alternative. Um, I think, and again, I'll be speaking to those as the weeks come ahead uh, in these budget conversations. I think most people kind of understand what an alter, even, even if we haven't seen it yet here, what an alternative mental health response might look like. I think the one that uh, I'm even, I, it, equally excited about is the violence interruption program possibility. I know Dallas, 
I was just looking this up earlier, Dallas City Council just approved funding for a violence interruption program. Uh, Durham, North Carolina, um, Newark already has one where we see a uh, 50% reduction in homicide. I wanna say that again. And you're gonna hear it from me a whole lot for the rest of the time I'm in this city. A 50%, 50% reduction in homicides in the South Ward there in Newark. 30, 30 year low in crime. So excited about that possibility for us. My question for you, and it really just, I, I feel kind of like a dum dumb for not ever thinking about it, but hearing so much of the work you all are doing um, in municipal courts and knowing that those violence interrupters are not just out there building those relationships that a lot of them already have within their communities that are the most um, troubled with, with, with violence. It's about also connecting residents in these different neighborhoods to resources. And hearing you describe the work you all are doing, it strikes me that a violence interruption team could also, this could be part of the resources, they, the educational resources they could be contributing to members of the community. So like when you mentioned like Remerge and North Care and Homeless Alliance and partnering with them and stuff like that, or the information you just shared with us about the warrant recalls, it just strikes me that your work on that uh, community policing uh, working group um, and the violence interruption program whatever shape that ends up taking for us. It just strikes me that municipal courts could play a vital role in um, working with whatever our program ends up looking like to be out there in the community and getting these resources, this, this, this information into the hands of folk who um, most often you know, might not have any information on that. So I just wanna know if that's something that you know, you all can bring to the conversation as you all are discussing the violence interruption program is the role that municipal court, court, excuse me, and the information you all have, the resources you all have. Uh, I just feel like that could be part of that conversation, that violence interruption conversation. I don't know what feedback you have that maybe that's just more of a suggestion on my part. Thank you, Councilperson Cooper. And the community outreach program would, uh, they actually do a lot of community outreach events pre-pandemic, uh, they would uh, work with the neighborhood allowance, they would work with the uh, uh, African-American uh, pastors uh, to help educate them in regards to the, uh, the different programs that they have available so they can take back to their congregation. We also work with the Latino community to uh, educate them on the, uh, the services and the programs that we have, and also the Oklahoma City Public School District. So um, I'm open to continue to explore those opportunities and continue to infuse our, uh, our outreach program within our community to share the information that's in the, in the services that we offer in municipal court. I think that's great. And I would just encourage you during the, your conversations with your, you know, on your working group, like let them know all this important work you're already doing. So maybe it's not about duplicating, you know, efforts, you know, work hard, work smarter, not harder, they say. Um, but all that really just to say, LaShawn, every time I hear you speak on any of your work and your, your team's work, I remain uh, just infinitely uh, impressed and I don't like using adverbs. So the fact that I just said infinitely really, uh, <laughs> I really am impressed with what you do. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. LaShawn, I just wanna say uh, thank you as well. I know we've heard it, but 98% of court patrons satisfied speaks to your leadership. Um, so I, I do wanna commend you for uh, the way you have been able to to work through this pandemic, because I know if any anyone has been affected, it has truly been our court system besides uh, those who have been essential workers in this era as well. So thank you all. And also to our judges who have been able to work with all of our patrons and our residents for our city through this time as well. So again, thank you for your leadership and your staff is to be commended uh, tremendously um, for uh, the innovation and the innovative ways that we're looking at how you're gonna even implement this evening court. And I, 
I think that excites me the most to know that uh, we're working with the folks who are the most vulnerable, depending on what time they work, uh, to be able to still have their day uh, to, to speak and, and, and have their voices heard. So I, I again, wanna thank you for that opportunity of serving our community. Thank you. All right, thank you, LaShawn. Really appreciate that. I do appreciate LaShawn's leadership. You know, she she suggested it too. Of um, you know, all departments have dealt with a lot of issues with with COVID and how they manage through this. But hers especially is just that it's such a frontline service to our customers. And I appreciate the way that she's led on that. Working with Judge James, who's also been a leader in working together, trying to figure out creative ways to respond. And so they've done a great job with this and and collaborating with so many other departments, as LaShawn mentioned. Um, to make sure that we are doing things in the right way and communicating properly. So I really do appreciate your leadership, LaShawn. Um, so next up, we have Chief Gorley with the uh, police department to present the police department budget. All right, well, thank you everyone. Uh, Mayor, Council, Mr. City Manager. Thank you for the opportunity to present this today. Um, we're getting the presentation pulled up now. Um, I just also want to briefly, before we get started, thank all of my deputy chiefs, my command staff, and all the employees, both sworn and non-sworn with the police department, that have really helped us through a uh, trying year with a pandemic and budget cuts. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, a future now of hopefully getting out of the pandemic and being able to do a lot more community act interaction and other things that, that we enjoy as a police department. Um, basically with this budget, it's the overview of it, just to kind of give you some ideas, some things that you'll see is, is restoring items that were previously cut. And then it, trying to keep up with the uh, commitment to add non-sworn professional staff to keep our sworn staff doing police functions. And that's what we've been trying to do over the last several years. So in our first slide, you'll see our mission statement, our vision statement and our core values. Is it changed? Okay. The mission of the Oklahoma City Police Department is to deliver exceptional police services to our community with integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and equity. Those are our core values, and it's an acronym that spells out I care. The core values guide all of our employees and how to respond to all situations. They help us all hold each other accountable when we fall short and help commend and reinforce those officers when they do things well. It's the vision of the Oklahoma City Police Department to ensure Oklahoma City is one of the safest cities in the country through strong community relationships, innovative strategies, and healthy, well-trained officers. And you'll see a lot of these things that go toward our vision and our mission as we go through the next several slides. So to start off with our proposed fiscal year 22 budget, our operating uh, total is $211,179,325. For a total department budget of $227,731,144. And as you look through that, you'll see it's divided between the different areas of the police department, administration, investigation, operations, public safety support, capital and non-operating expenses, and then less city, uh, less transfers to city funds. These things include wage adjustments from the police sales tax and the 911 subsidy. This budget is a 0.57% increase from the fiscal, fiscal year 21 adopted budget. And in the next slide, it's just a breakdown of uh, where these, where the funding comes from, the different areas and the percentages. The majority of our funding comes out of the general fund at 65%. And then you'll see the other various areas there, such as the police sales tax fund. One thing I will point out, uh, the Better Street Safer City Use Tax, even though that ended in 2020, we're still continuing uh, that. There is a balance left in there to cover fleet replacement. And because of COVID and other things and just the way that vehicles are ordered and how they're delivered, that fund will probably be present for a little bit longer as we're still taking a delivery of, of vehicles. And that'll take a while for that to, to catch up. So the main thing, like I said before, is we're trying to restore funding um, from our, our previous budget cuts. And these are the most of the, the budget changes that you'll see. So first off, we wanna restore funding for our 34 budgeted positions that were frozen in the fiscal year 21 budget. If you remember, we had a staffing study conducted several years ago 
And in that study, I believe it was released somewhere around 2012, um, it recommended an increase of 142 um, officers at the time. And you think about, you know, how much the, the city has grown since then and uh, uh, just, you know, where we're at now, we're really understaffed uh, to cover 631 square miles and all of the things that we deal with. So restoring these positions will help us at least get to full strength and to at least do as much as we can to, um, to police this large community. And then you'll see too later when we talk about adding sworn or non-sworn positions that that will help us keep more of our sworn personnel out on the streets to keep the community safe. It also gives the department the continued ability to manage the criminal interdiction team of central Oklahoma. You may remember this, this was an item that was brought before council in August of 2020. We had a program called Commit, um, which was an interdiction team that had been in place for many years and was headed up by the Oklahoma County District Attorney's Office. Last year, due to the pandemic and some staffing cuts within their office, the District Attorney's Office had to pull out and they could no longer manage the program. But because of the great work they were doing in preventing crime on our interstates, human trafficking that we've seen increases in over the last several years, things like that, we did not want this program to go away. So the Oklahoma City Police Department took that over. And uh, um, so part of the uh, uh, budget will include the items that we have to manage, better manage that and restore that funding. There's changes in personnel related costs, such as salaries, step increases, retirement, health insurance and other benefits. Those are things that we see each year. Some other changes, we want to restore six non sworn professional staff positions, which were deleted in the fiscal 21 year budget. These are things such as an administrative support technician, a senior crime analyst, a property crime specialist, a system specialist to help us with a lot of our um, uh, computer systems and, and related systems that we have just to manage on a day-to-day -day basis, restores a police report, report clerk and an office assistant in the traffic program. The police recruit project uh, will allow us to run two recruit classes during this fiscal year, and that includes equipment and supplies. So in keeping with our expansion of non-sworn professional staff to not only increase our efficiency, but allow sworn staff to, to do policing related functions related directly to safety, we wanna add three civilian crime scene investigators to our CSI unit. This unit has seen no increase in personnel in over 20 years. However, the demands on this unit have greatly increased. Um, crime scenes have become more complicated in how we collect evidence and the way we do that. And uh, um, it's just putting a lot more demand on these employees. So adding three more positions um, that are in the civilian um, realm will help us to better meet the need that is being uh, uh, put on these folks. It also replaces three sworn officers with civilian crime scene investigators. H how this has occurred, you know, even though we're adding the three additional, we're also replacing sworn positions. So there was a memorandum of understanding with the FOP several years ago that through attrition, as sworn officers move out of these positions, they would be replaced with the non-sworn professional staff, um, civilian crime scene investigators. And, and with that, what we've had is through attrition, we've had some officers that have gotten promoted or have left or have retired. And so that's the uh, um, three that will be added in this area. The good thing about this is it returns three sworn positions to field duties. It also adds an administrative coordinator to assist in processing purchase orders and payments. This is an area that has, uh, has grown quite a bit, managing the different grants, all of the things that are, are uh, just part of running the police department now have just become more complicated with the purchasing. So this will help assist our finance department in, in being able to do that. And it adds a business intelligence specialist to analyze data and promote informed and timely decision-making. This is something you're seeing in several other departments around the city, but across the country as well. Um, we're police officers, we shouldn't be doing this type of specialized work. And these business uh, intelligence positions will help us gather complex data that uses statistical methods to analyze the data, identify trends and patterns in data sets and creating models and presentations of findings. The goal is to use the information we already collect to assist us in making informed data-driven and supported decisions regarding critical functions of the department. Some potential applications that you may see from this position are staffing. How can we better utilize our staffing and make sure it's in the appropriate areas? Um, allocation and distribution of resources to include equipment and vehicles, 
and improving efficiencies and responses to calls for service by identifying patterns and trends in specific call types or requests for police services. This graphic just talks about our operating budget and uh, you know what you've seen over the over the years in that. Probably the, the most interesting thing about this is our increase from fiscal year 21 to 22 is 3.32%. But again, these are bringing back uh, the positions, the unfrozen position, unfreezing the positions, and then the additions of the uh, non-sworn um, staff. And if you look to between fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 22, the increase is only at 0.72%. So I want to talk about some things that we're doing uh, in response to community needs and, and just things that are specific to Oklahoma City. Um, all around the country, there's been a trend of violent crime being on an uptick. And so we wanted to figure out better ways to address that. And we had noticed that that had started within Oklahoma City over the last few years, too. So we wanted to make sure that that wasn't something that got away from us. So the Violent Crimes Apprehension Team was formed on March 20th of 2020. VCAT activity for the first full year included the following, 883 felony arrests, 183 misdemeanor arrests, and 98 search warrants completed. Only 1.7% 1 of 1,066 arrests resulted in a use of force, and there's been no formal complaints. They've also seized 328 firearms and over 1,600 pounds of narcotics. The thing about this unit when it was developed and I'll talk more about it in the next slide, but we, we brought in very specialized individuals because we knew they were gonna be dealing with the most violent type of criminals, the most violent type of uh, crimes that are out there to include homicides, shootings, and other gang-related type crimes. And so we wanted to make sure that they were very specially trained, um, that they would not be rushing into things and, and getting into encounters you know, based on their actions. And we wanted them to be able to to respond to these situations. So that's why this team was developed um, out of a need that we'll talk about in the next slide. So what we noticed as a team within the police department is that violent crime was rising and we had a lot of separate entities within the police department that were each kind of doing their own things instead of all of us working together to combat violent crime. For example, if we had a homicide occurred um, if it was gang related, the gang unit might get involved in it, but if it wasn't, then they weren't going to have any involvement in it. Um, in that same homicide, once homicide got over, the homicide detectives got there to work the scene, patrol kind of backed away from it and other units because, well, that's a homicide case. And so the philosophy behind what we're doing is now that every major crime that occurs in this city is not belongs to one special unit. It belongs to the entire police department. It's an Oklahoma City case. And we're going to do everything we can to work and solve that case. And how this came about was a little two year old girl who probably did more to change this police department in the last year than anyone ever has. Two year old Rye Thomas was murdered on December 16th, 2019. The homicide unit collected evidence, conducted interviews. And again, this was the, the kind of the old method of doing things. And the case kind of went cold. cold. So when VCAT was created, the gang unit was disbanded and VCAT was created. This became their focus is not only this homicide, but others, and, and especially this one because of this little girl. Um, photos of her were placed around detectives offices and other officers that had their, her photo to drive them in solving this crime. So through massive partnerships, not only within the police department, but the community and local law enforcement in this area and our federal partners as well, we changed how we collected and processed evidence, made a lot of changes in uh, especially firearms related evidence. And with the help of uh, the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms, they brought in a specialized truck to help train um, our technicians better in how to process ballistic evidence and also increase our staffing in that area to catch up not only on a backlog, but at least get us faster at processing the evidence came in. So how the break in this, came, this case came was um, last summer, a firearm was recovered and through, uh, through uh, study of that firearm and the casings involved with it, we were able to trace that firearm back to the murder of this little girl. And things kind of began to snowball from there in exactly one year to the day on December 16th, 2020, an arrest was made in this case. It's still an active and ongoing investigation, so I won't talk much more about that. But this to me really highlights how when something devastating happens in our community, 
how the police department and the community can come together to make great changes and strides to move forward in how we investigate crime so that hopefully no one will have to deal with this again. It also resulted in changes to our cold case unit and we've added personnel to that because we don't want anyone to have to lose a family member in this community and not have some type of closure to that. So we're even looking back at homicides that are unsolved back for the for the past several years and trying to do more to solve those crimes as well. This next area also in response to community feedback that we've been listening to over the last uh, um, year is more training and more realistic training. We had scenario based training, but it was sporadic in when we uh, completed it and it wasn't always available to us. It was a big ordeal to bring in the trainers, to bring in an area to set up to do this simulated training. And so we created what we call the reality based training unit. And our goal is to simulate realistic critical incidents through scenario based training and continually enhance each officer's ability to adapt to stress, to make sound tactical decisions that further our commitment to sanctity of life. And sanctity of life is basically that our, our goal every day and every encounter is that everybody goes home safe. We want to make sure that every officer is trained in de-escalation tactics, teamwork, communication, critical decision making, medical aid, post force aid to do anything possible to avoid violent confrontations. And so the more training we can get that's reality based and scenario based, the more realistic it is it is, the better we're going to be at uh, handling these types of situations. This team is, is comprised of active members of the tactical unit and experienced instructors in one of three critical law enforcement disciplines. This includes de-escalation, control and defensive tactics, including less lethal and law enforcement driver training, as well as firearms. Part of the reality-based training too is what we call return to duty training or uh, return to duty protocols after critical incidents so that we're not just throwing officers back into a situation once the investigation is over or they've been cleared. Most of these serious incidents will include, thing, include things like officer involved shootings, um, in custody deaths, but they could be any type of incident that just has an impact on the officer and we wanna make sure that they're prepared both mentally and physically to go back out into the workforce and to deal with these situations. So officers that participate in these will participate in exercises and scenarios with a broad range of outcomes. The training is co-hosted with the wellness unit to help determine if officers need additional time to cope or adjust to their trauma. Since February of 2021, 14 officers have successfully completed return to duty training. These scenarios are conducted in whatever their uniform of the day is. If they're an investigator and they're in plain clothes, then they'll go through the scenarios just as they would at work. If they're a patrol officer, they'll be in uniform. Whatever their normal assignment is, when they go through scenarios, they'll go through it just like they're equipped for a day at work. We've been able to identify officers who need extra time to cope or adjust prior to returning to duty. And our hope is that through incorporating wellness and the wellness of the officer, that we could be preventing future issues from occurring just by taking these extra steps before we put someone back to work. Another area that's been identified uh, to us through listening to the community, community feedback over the past year is the need to proactively release timely and complete information after critical incidents. So this is why we, we created an expansion of the Office of Me, uh, Media Relations. Professionals with experience in the news media industry were hired to fill two digital media positions. And these positions will facilitate information sharing with the public regarding critical incidents, new initiatives, training, and interactions with the community. One of the things I've consistently heard over and over besides the fact of the need to get information out more quickly is oftentimes when I sit down with members of the community and they ask me questions and I talk about what we're doing, I get the same response every time if we had no idea you were doing that. So we wanna get better at getting those stories out and letting the public know what they're doing and what their tax dollars are going to. This aligns with recommendations of the 21CP uh, consulting group, the task force, the community policing working group, all of this to improve information sharing. This is funded by a JAG grant, which is the Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistant Grant. And uh, the positions will operate as a team in producing and disseminating information to department employees and the public. They'll release critical incident briefing videos immediately after all critical incidents or within a time frame 
that is much quicker than what we've done before, depending on the type of incident. So some anticipated upcoming projects are Sanctity of Life. We'll be explaining more about that and what that chief's directive includes. Reality-based training, the return to duty protocols, the mission statement, core values and vision, what those mean. Our debriefing culture and our advanced mental health training, which is a multi-part project, as well as our mental health partnerships at Spring Lake and Santa Fe Division that we'll, you'll see more in another slide coming up. Another area that we've seen a need in over the past year, especially due to the pandemic, is what we call our Youth Enrichment Services now. This is formerly our, true, our, formerly our truancy unit. Officers have worked with Oklahoma City Public Schools to identify students who have been exposed to trauma or displacement. What we found through looking at truancy, and I really got to hand it to the officers in this unit because they're the ones that identified this and made the changes and came up with this idea, worked to get these partnerships and have done a really good job. But Truancy is about much more than just not going to school. Uh, there's usually some type of problem or something going on in the home that causes that. And so addressing it as a punishment isn't going to fix that problem. So the officers in the Youth Enrichment Services uh, Unit have identified this and they've, they use connections within the community-based organization and churches to provide immediate resources to students and their families that they may need. Some common contact types include home visits, mental health services, uh, Pivot referrals. Pivot is an organization that we partner with um, to help you know, outreach into the community and to get people things that they need, such as food, clothing, housing assistance. Um, and that is part of this too, is clothing assistance, food assistance, and then Handle with Care referrals. And if you'll remember, Handle with Care is a program that Oklahoma City Schools started. Uh, they partnered with us to do that a few years ago. And basically what it is, is anytime an officer interacts or may take a call somewhere, there may be some trauma that's going on in the home and an email is sent to an email address that the school is set up to let them know that there was a child there that was exposed to trauma and they can start the process the next day. Our youth enrichment services group also gets involved with that with those handle with care referrals and can help you know, start the process there and getting them um, hooked up with services that they need. So in the spring of uh, 2021, just so far this semester, we've had 1,256 contacts made with students and their families to identify needs and provide resources. I wanna be clear, that's not 1,256 different homes, but each person that they're able to provide resources in those homes that they're going out to visit, that's the amount of contacts and the amount of people that they were, ever, uh, were able to help. So now with, with uh, truancy, when you look at that as a, as a problem within the schools, citations are only written as a last resort. And usually, you know, when they've exhausted all other efforts to try and help them, but they're still not going to school. Next is another thing we're very proud of as a police department, the Police Athletic League, um, and adapting to the challenge of a COVID pandemic uh, because youth sports, team sports gathering, you know, when the physical leagues were canceled because of the pandemic, officers had to find innovative, innovative solutions to connect with student athletes. And this is just one of the ways they did this is through a, um, what's called an eSports league. So some highlights of this league, the uh, three seasons to it, summer, fall, and winter, they've been hosted already and including several virtual tournaments that average about five to 15 Oklahoma City Public School student players. The fall league championship game was live broadcasted by OU Esports. And that's something that was very interesting uh, to me and all of our staff when we were looking at this is we didn't realize what a big deal this had become. There are actually uh, scholarships and universities are setting up facilities specifically for esports and to help these kids create a career in this. So it's something that's really moving forward. And we really think that, uh, you know, PAL needs to be a part of that as well. In December of 2020, two collegiate recruiting visits with OU Esports and OKC Powell High School students and their families occurred. An, OK, an Oklahoma City Public School student managed and live broadcasted games during the Winter League. There's been 116 students that have participated or shown interest in the program since December of 2020. We, we only expect this to grow. Um, it's, been a, uh, it's been a wonderful outreach and it's raised, um, uh, there was a fundraiser back in March of this year that was hosted in collaboration with OU Esports uh, and Equinox, and they raised over $8,000 to help support PAL in this endeavor. So this next video we wanna show is just a little bit about not only um, 
uh, how we interact with the community, but how our school resource officers can really make a difference. And this, what you'll see through this is also one of our officers, Master Sergeant uh, Compost, has expanded his impact on Oklahoma City's youth and is now involved in the Youth Enrichment Services Program. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, show this video to explain more about this outreach. School Resource Officers, uh, SROs, we have 18. They cover 17 schools. Their main role is pretty much the school safety. They're there to protect the people inside that school. While they do that, they develop a lot of relationships. There's a lot of mentoring. So we have a story we'd like to share with you of uh, a three generational SRO relationship of students that were in a school with a police officer that mentored them. My father was a police officer with Oklahoma City for 32 years. I began working um, at the Oklahoma County Sheriff's Department and then they began their school resource program. So I was chosen to be in the Crooked Oak schools. I was assigned to the middle school at that time. A lot of law enforcement officers and school resource officers, they go into their job hoping that you can make a difference in somebody's life. I mean, that's the number one thing most of us say. Why do you want to be a police officer? To help somebody. And there's a lot of different circumstances that you don't know if you did or not. So I went to Crooked Oak High School, uh, Crooked Oak Public Schools. I was a roughneck. It's an unwritten rule there living in the South Side, the people that I grew up around, that we just didn't like police. But they had these county SROs there. It was law enforcement there, but with their guard down. So we could let our guard down. Without them knowing, without the, the police officers knowing that they're influencing us, they were. And one of them was Kim Spencer, who's now teaching me. So I've struck up many conversations with her, and I talked to her about law enforcement. There was a lot of kids that were doing drugs, that were um, in gangs and everything, and I was around all of that. I, I knew I didn't want to be a part of that. I want to be an athlete, so I put, was playing football. One of the things that she told me, and I can remember this like if it was yesterday, she told me that Oklahoma City was the best, the best department in the state. I never thought I would become a police officer. I thought I would go into banking or something like that. And I applied and I and got hired on in 2004. You could make such an impact and a difference. And I didn't even realize why he came to the city. I asked him once and then he told me it was me. It really touched my heart because it let me know that, oh, okay, so you know what you were trying to do really, it did work out. While I was on patrol, my lieutenant at the time, he called me one time and he said, hey, I think you, you'd be really good at the SRO position. I got assigned to several middle schools and my goal was to become a high school SRO. Grant came open and I, I started at Grant. I loved working with the high school age kids. I loved you know, being in the halls, having kids come talk to me. Just like I talked to Kim, being approachable. There was a weight room. I take off my uniform and work out with them. You know, just to show that, hey, we are human too. So I was born in Oklahoma City. I've been here my whole life, Southwest Oklahoma City. Uh, my father passed away, we moved houses. My mom picked up an extra job, so I started helping her with that extra job when I was 13. I went to middle, uh, Jefferson Middle School, just hanging around with the wrong crowd, hanging around with gang members, just doing things I wasn't supposed to be doing. A dark time in my life. And then that's when I uh, went to U.S. Grand High School. And around this time, I was uh, extremely overweight. So I started eating better and working out a little bit. But that wasn't really cutting because I was still hanging around with those friends. I would skip class a lot. Um, so I started hanging around with uh, Sergeant Campos, which was the SRO at U.S. Grand High School. He saw that I was really into fitness. Uh, he saw that I was motivated into working out. So he reached out to me and a bunch of other my uh, workout buddies during weight class and would come in and just work out with us on a daily basis and the more consistent it became the more i got to realize that he was just a normal person besides being a police officer and when i graduated i had my mindset that i wanted to be a police officer i went to college got fortunate enough to get hired and here i am today I'm happily married with my high school sweetheart we've been together for eight years married for two uh, we are parents of two beautiful twin girls. Now I'm uh, in the fact unit working with students, working with, uh, with the youth, and we're mentors as their friend, and we're there to support them. And so what you do, directly or indirectly, influences the people that you're around. And that's what I took whenever I was the SRO, whenever I was mentoring Jesse. Having uh, the SROs in school is actually really important, um, and I'm a great example why. I think it's important to have school resource officers in school because it's worth it. It ends up changing you as well. 
and it impacts you as a person. The school resource officers play a, a huge role uh, with the mentoring and the relationship building it has a far reaching impact in those students lives that, that spread through the community. So I think that's a great testament to three, basically three generations of police officers there um, that that all initiated through positive interactions at our school resource um, community and our, our school resource officers. So uh, that was uh, something I thought was was very neat. And I didn't even know until uh, most of us on our staff didn't realize until that story was told. So um, moving ahead to some other ways that we're coordinating partnerships and resources throughout the community. Uh, I believe it was in 2019, we uh, uh, watched a presentation at Major City Chiefs where an agency presented how they had hired a couple of social workers internally um, to help with some of the social needs in their community. And through their budget process and other things, they were only able to hire um, a few of these workers. And, and we realized and we started looking at that want to do something similar here, but we thought, how can we have a greater reach and a, a greater impact on our community? Because we're so spread out, we're such a large city, and we have so many interactions with the public that oftentimes as police officers, we just walk away from. So for example, an officer may get a call to a burglary report. Someone's had their house broken into. But while they're in the home, they realize that maybe their um, electricity has been turned off. There's a food um, issue there. They don't have enough food. Uh, maybe they've lost a job. They're about to get kicked out of their home and other things that are, that are happening that the officers oftentimes would be very frustrated that they just had to walk away from that. So, so we looked at partnering with agencies and organizations that we already had in place and said, you know, hey, how do we bridge this gap between these police calls for service and public mental health assistance and help officers, you know, feel like they're still able to do something, even though it's outside of their work, of their realm. And we had police officers that would buy groceries for families, you know, help them fix things on their property, but it wasn't really solving the problem. Also, too, when I when I visited um, with some of these representatives when we were looking at this partnership, I never realized how difficult it was sometimes to get services started for people to navigate through that system. So again, through this pilot program that began in Spring Lake Division in August of 2020, we started looking at ways to bridge that gap and through a partnership to include Oklahoma Department of Human Services, North Care, and Metro Tech, who Metro Tech actually provided office space to be in the community um, for, their, for their DHS workers and, and uh, to be able to be more present and available to quickly respond to these situations. The program provides expedited mental health services um, and state benefit resources to people in or nearing a state of crisis. Officers in the field are supported by resource coordinators and mental health specialists and the referrals from officers in the field are sent to participating partners who coordinate the services as soon as possible. It's created an avenue for follow-up on calls where officers were previously unable to provide any meaningful assistance. Some examples of this could be, we take a call where a person doesn't necessarily meet the criteria to be placed in protective custody, but it's obvious they're struggling. Uh, maybe they're off their medication and they just need some help so they can get that response out there. Officers also before had the inability to intervene until someone had reached the point of crisis. So now we don't have to wait until it gets there. Some situations with overwhelmed family members just without knowledge or mean to access the mental health resources or the resources that are available to them through the Department of Human Services. And again, these can sometimes be very difficult to navigate. So bridging that gap was really helpful in that. The timeliness of services is a tremendous benefit of the program. Referrals completed by officers are staffed weekly in a multidisciplinary setting within the partnership agencies, partnering agencies, and they try to, to respond to these as quickly as possible. Um, just to give you some examples of some preliminary result, results between August 1st of 2020 and March 17th of uh, 2021, there were 136 referrals made by our officers. 84% of those were completed referrals and are considered successful. What a successful referral means is that they made contact. It doesn't necessarily mean that the person accepted the services, but that contact was made with them. The only time it's considered a not successful referral is if no contact was made, which usually results in challenges with the homeless community. But 
chances are we'll encounter that person again and they'll, they'll get another shot at it. Um, the program expanded to include Santa Fe Division and Youth Enrichment Services in early 2021. Our goal is to take this department wide so that every police officer will be able to make referrals. We're just trying to build up the infrastructure a little bit more. Um, I know North Care has applied for a grant that should help us in this and uh, um, also in, in community response to mental health. And so uh, our partners have been very excited about this. Um, I talked to the directors of North Care and the DHS. They were going to try to be on today, but um, they're they're very busy and uh, just couldn't couldn't be on there to talk about some of that success. But it's it's been a very exciting program. We we just met about it again last week, and you know the key to this is that in less than nine months, 100, 136 individuals and families have had the opportunity to receive resources when they most needed them. Uh, just some things to look at that are available through this program. Uh, it, it provides food to people in need, health care, utility assistance, non-emergency mental health services, child care, transportation, child or adolescent behavior problems, elderly assistance, employment, legal assistance, rental assistance, and really just those things that are non-police related types of events, but we encounter those every day as police officers out in the field. So I want to talk a little bit about our crisis intervention team what we're doing with that, some changes that we made and we're looking at. And keep in mind too, this is also part of um, our task force and working group, things that they're looking at to help us move forward into the future and expand you know, these type of services. OCPD has 158 CIT certified officers, which is 25% of patrol officers. CIT International recommends just that between 20 and 25%. So we're at the 25. In 2020, out of 19,481 mental health related calls for service, officers were able to facilitate immediate mental health intervention in 42% of those incidents. Only 0.9% of mental health calls resulted in some type of transport to a detention facility or the public inebriate alternative. That, that amounts to about 166 out of the 19,481 calls. Those that were not taken in custody on mental health calls um, it averaged, it was about uh, 8,259, I believe, um, that resulted in, I'm sorry, that did result in a mental health custody or transport to a facility. So in most cases, we're trying to do everything we can to help those individuals and not get them put into the system if they don't have to be. One of the ways that we're able to do that um, is through better screening of calls, as you'll see on the next slide. Beginning in December of 2020, on-duty CIT officers are required to respond to any attempted or threatened suicide when a person meets criteria for protective custody and when a person could be in emotional or physical crisis. They're also required to respond if they're requested by the 911 communications dispatcher, um, another officer, a resident or calling party, a caregiver, a family member, or someone that is maybe part of a crisis center mobile team. This is all part of some enhanced 911 communication screening protocol for mental health calls. And it includes just the dispatchers asking a little bit more questioning to get at, you know, what is the root cause of why they're calling in? The call may start out as a disturbance or something very general, but then the officers or the uh, dispatchers are trained to ask certain questions to try to get the, at the root of the issue. Um, for example, they may ask, is the person, have they been um, diagnosed with any form of mental illness? Um, are they drinking? Are they taking non-prescription drugs? Do they feel like they're a threat to themselves or their others? Are they violent? Do they need an ambulance? Just things like that to try to get to the root cause of the problem. Of course, if it's a, if it's a major emergency and people are saying they really need help right then, we're not gonna screen or slow that down. We're still gonna make sure we have a rapid response to that situation. So in this next slide, this is something that is fairly new uh, to the police department and the state, came out of some changes to state law and some funding uh, through the Department of Mental Health. I believe there was some grant funding involved in this too with them to provide officers in the state of Oklahoma with iPads. And these iPads allow CIT officers to connect with mental health professionals in the field for immediate assistance. And some program partners with this are Hope, North Care, and Red Rock. Uh, this is a, a video that we just happen to have um, one of our uh, digital media specialists riding with an officer who is a CIT, and this is an actual call that was recently taken, and this, taken, and this will show you how the, the iPad worked and allowed this individual to interact with the trained counselor. 
The situation is just so desperate. We need to start having a serious conversation nationally about the fact that we don't have the mental health support services out there that we desperately need. I think there's uh, a lot of ways that technology can help our uh, officers do their jobs better. We do have a program out there right now that actually uh, is uh, an asset. The iPads that have been made available to our CIT officers are equipped to access licensed mental health professionals 24 hours a day, seven days a week. What's going on? Uh, I'm got confused here lately. I uh, don't understand what's reality and what's not sometimes. I have kind of a new thing that we have an iPad that I can let you talk to a mental health professional over the iPad and see what, what their thoughts might be. And let's let you talk to somebody from Hope and let's see what we can make happen from there and then we'll, once you get finished talking to them, we'll come up with a plan. You called me and you wanted help and that's what I'm gonna get you, okay? Hi there. He called us, called 911, and asked for us to come talk to him about some resources and some help. He's actually he's in the back seat of my car, and I'd like to just hand him the iPad, let him talk to you, and let, let you see what you can make happen. And I'll just let you guys talk for a little bit, okay? Interventions that the iPad's appropriate for, I find I just give them the iPad, let them sit in the back seat of the car, let them stand outside the car, and I try to give them some distance let them have a private conversation. That way he's a little more honest about what's going on. Okay, I think that we made a good plan. He just needs that help, and so we'll make that happen. Be safe, man, I will. okay? Thank you. Call us anytime, okay? Advancements like this are what inspire me. Advancements like this is what gives me hope when you're actually able to uh, accomplish something and uh, get somebody into a safe place. So our mental health focus moving forward, it's already been discussed this morning. Uh, the city manager is proposing $300,000 for an initial program to enhance mental health partnerships in our community. The police department will continue collaborating with 21CP, the community policing working, uh, the community policing working group and the mayor's task force to develop innovative solutions for connecting resources, uh, residents to the resources they need. This is a big focus and part of that, and we hope this only continues this partnership with, uh, um, with North Care and DHS. We, we see it only growing and good things happening with that. And so just in conclusion, the police department, I just wanna say, you know, again, I appreciate all of our staff and getting through uh, COVID last year as a group. Um, and I wanna really point out too, as you've seen from these, these slides and what we're trying to do working with the community, is that the police department is not separate from the community that we serve, we're part of it. We live here, work here, we're part of it. Again, we raise our families, we volunteer, we coach, and we want a better life for all of us. We meet with many in the community on a regular basis and have made it a point to listen to each other instead of talking at each other. Through these interactions, change is happening because we educate each other on both sides of every issue. The community learns more about the police and the police learn about the community so real solutions can be developed particular and helpful to our city and not something developed for somewhere else. This is productive interaction. We certainly believe this will continue and only get better. And again, I'm very proud of the work that's been done so far. And with that, if anyone has any questions, um, uh, feel free, I'll be happy to answer them. Hey, this is Mark Stonecipher, how are you today? Good, sir, how are you? Uh, great presentation. Uh, last night I was looking at some notes from uh, uh, our meetings in uh, 2020. And then we're looking at some notes from Russell Evans uh, from this year where uh, Russell promised me that we were just gonna have a mild contraction and I didn't need to use the R word. And so I'm, I'm gonna hold him to that. Um, the one thing that, that kind of stands out in my mind is that in, in 2020, we cut the police budget by 5.5 million. And in 2019, 2020, that year's budget, uh, we had about $232 million that went to the police. Today, we're, we're down to 
227 million. So we're 5 million lower than we were uh, in 2020. And the one thing that, that concerns me is you use the word understaffed. And uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts and your discussions on understaffed uh, or the way, if our police department is understaffed. I know that we did a, a third party consulting um, report that was prepared that looked at um, whether our police department was understaffed. And I think it looked at about a eight year period that was gonna end in 2020. And at that time they found that we immediately needed an additional 142 officers. And every year thereafter, we should hire an additional 35 uh, per year. And I don't think we're, we're, we're getting there when we're cutting your budget by 5 million. So I would appreciate you kind of updating us on where we are as far as understaffing. And if you don't have those numbers, if you could supply them to all of us at some point in time. Sure, uh, thank you for bringing that up. And, and I, the best way I can explain it is as I hear um, council and the mayor oftentimes talk about how difficult it is to manage a city this size. And they talk about it, you talk about it in terms of like the streets and the roads. And it's really no different from a law enforcement standpoint because we are so spread out, but our population is growing. And it's growing in a lot of these outlying areas of the city as much it is, as it is in the internal areas. So it becomes very complicated and difficult to police. And that staffing study that you're talking about, um, I believe when it was started, it was somewhere around, uh, somewhere around 2008, 2009. And, and I, I believe it was actually um, released in 2012. And by those numbers that you were talking about, they did say 142 uh, immediately to get us up to, to a better level then. And that was in 2012, which we've grown a lot since then. But if you follow those guidelines, of increasing at 35 per year uh, up to 2020, I show where we should be at around 1,556 officers. And if you look at cities that are pretty comparable to us, um, Fort Worth, Kansas City, uh, Missouri are ones that I look at. Um, they all have more officers, even though they may have smaller land size, but Fort Worth is pretty comparable. And I believe last time I checked, they were somewhere around 1,600. Uh, in their police officers. So if you look at the budget and what we're trying to do, one of the big things that we try to do is do more with less. And as a team, you know, we, we, if we increase our uh, non-sworn staff doing functions that normally a sworn police officer would do, that allows us to put those police officers back on the street and then better deal with, you know, the crime and other situations that police officers are designed uh, as a function to deal with. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed your, your community outreach a portion of your report, especially the, the PAL eSports program and uh, also the mental health pilot program with North Care DHS and, and the hopes that that can be expanded citywide. Uh, also the, uh, uh, the new internal program such as reality-based training units, uh, return, the return to duty program, which helps uh, with wellness for our officers um, the uh, media relations expansion. I think those are all important things that we are working hard on. Uh, one thing I did want to know about was uh, the new body cam RFP. What, what is that going to bring us? Uh, is it going to expand the number of cameras? And where are we at with that right now? Sure. If you look at uh, our body cam program has been in place for several years. And, and I always use like, you know, your phones as an example. Every few years you start looking at your phone, it's running slower, it's not doing what it needs to do and you wanna get a new one and update to the newest model. Cameras are the same way. Um, when we initially ordered the cameras and, and of course the infrastructure and everything that goes with it is very costly. So they're at a point where the cameras that we have now are kind of at the end of their life. Um, the battery functions aren't as good. They're, they're breaking down more. Uh, and also too, not every officer has a camera right now, every patrol officer. So our goal is, to as we move forward, not only replace and update the cameras through this new RFP, but also provide cameras to each officer so they don't have to swap them out, um, which again, it, it degrades the life of them as well. So with this current RFP that we have now that we're looking at, we're still working on uh, the funding and getting that process in place, but I'm very hopeful that within this fiscal year, we'll be able to update our body cameras and get new ones in the, in the uh, hands of our officers. And, and have better coverage, you know, for the community too, to help increase that transparency. The other thing I wanted to say was um, in our latest citizen survey, uh, the police, the quality of police service had a 71% approval rating. And I think that's important to emphasize 
especially the fact that that was uh, 12% above our national average. Uh, I think that approval rating uh, speaks volumes. I think the approval rating that we, we obtained from our, our fire department and the approval rating we were uh, obtained from our municipal courts, we saw all three of those things today. And, and all three of those different departments working hard on improving the city. And I think it's important to note that that's why in our last survey, 85% uh, of the people that were surveyed uh, said Oklahoma City is a great place to live. 79% of the people said it's a great place to work. And, um, and, and most importantly in my mind is 76% of the people surveyed said the city is moving in the right direction. Oklahoma City is a great place to live is 34% above the national average. And I think everybody should remember that. But I think most importantly, what I wanna to say to you, Chief, is that there are many of us uh, that back the police. There are many of us that support the police. And there are many of us that wanna help the police move forward. And we wanna back the badge. Thank you for your service. Thank you, sir, I appreciate that. And that extends to all of our employees, my executive staff, my deputy chiefs that are on the uh, the video conference today. Couldn't do what I do without them um, and the service that they provide to the community and it extends all the way down throughout the department. And uh, we know too that we have to earn that backing. And so we wanna keep doing things to help build that community trust and keep moving forward in that as well. But I do appreciate the support. Chief, I wanna say thank you for that presentation uh, and also extend a thanks to your staff and all of the officers um, and civilians who work within the department and, and uh, the jobs that you guys are doing. Uh, I thought that was really interesting on the iPad uh, connectivity with a mental health expert. Do you have any idea of like how many of those we actually have in the field currently? Our goal is to have them all in, in the hands of all of our uh, CIT um, officers. The, the problem or the challenge with it right now, and it'll only get better, is what's available on the other end of that with the trained counselors and how, uh, how, how many of those are available. My understanding is, again, there were several bills um, this year that addressed mental health within the state legislature. And my understanding is, is that they want to provide more funding to expand that more. Um, so we're, we're pretty much ready to go on our end. It's just, it's just the infrastructure that's in place that would allow that to occur more often. Excellent, thank you. Good morning, Chief. Good morning, Council Person. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Yeah, you know, about the same. Uh, I, I just have one question, but I think it might be a complicated one, which is um, state impact Oklahoma uh, reports that, I just wanna make sure I get this right. Uh, where to go, where to go? Yes, um, it says, and this was from last year, it said of, the depart of our department, 1,170 officers, 150, eight are trained in crisis intervention and they put that at 14% of the force. Could you connect that back to the numbers you shared earlier? I, I'm trying to get that, you know, I'm a data driven person. So I, if you can help me, um, cause as you very uh, helpfully pointed out uh, earlier, um, one of the six proposals is to not only meet that national 25% standard, right? but really get that training for all of our officers so that we can prepare them no matter the situation they encounter, even if they're not serving specifically on the team. So, um, so they're prepared and then the community is in a good place too. So win-win for everybody. So yeah, it said 158 uh, and they have us at 14 and you have? 25. 25, so what number, what, what number of our officers then, because State Impact says that's 158. What I thought I saw on a slide and I just didn't catch it in time, the number to write down from you. Yes, in the slide and, and what they're doing is they're taking our total number of police officers. So we have a lot of officers that are in non-patrol related assignments that would not respond to a person in crisis. So that percentage, if, if you, the way that you actually manage that and the way CIT International looks at that is of your officers that are available to respond, to a crisis in progress. So that's our patrol officers. 
And I believe those numbers at last check, I believe we're somewhere around, um, uh, cause it all changes with our staffing, but I believe we're around 550, somewhere around in there is our number of patrol officers. So that's where that, that percentage, uh, comes up. So it was 158 of those that are just signed to, to patrol. And I can get you more specific. I, I I'm just kind of guesstimating on the amount of our patrol officers, but that's where that percent percentage comes from, not from your total. Okay. That, so five, we have about five. 50 patrol officers and then of that 158 currently are CIT trained am I hearing that correctly correct and I, I can get you an exact number on the amount of patrol officers but I'm just I'm guessing that's about where we're at cool super helpful and I'm sure you're already having these conversations um, with the working group uh, who's trying to get us to that you know 100 percent so that's that's very helpful um, and it might be worth communicating Oh, go ahead. Oh. Finish your thought. Finish your thought. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say it might be helpful. Um, it might be helpful that we make these sorts of clarifications because there's been a lot of confusion in the last year. I mean, when I speak about it, because I'm so data driven, I, you know, I'll cite you and then I'll cite the state impact. So I've always been saying that that number is between that 14 and 25. So, um, anything we can do to kind of help with that clarification. But again, I'm, I'm guessing you're already sharing those actual numbers with the working group so that they can get us to where we need to be. And then Councilwoman Hammond. Well, I just wanted to, if you have other things, like I don't want to interrupt your other questions, but I did while we're on the subject. Um, so in the budget book, it's saying that the adopted positions for patrol last year were 773. Is that correct or is that a wrong print? That would probably be fully staffed. Um, and I'd have to look at that number, but that's not what we have right now in patrol. So does that then not include folks who are in traffic safety or like the police officers who are in our schools? Like, so we, we're not expecting them to be crisis intervention trained or not including them in the number of what we judge ourselves on? No, not with CIT. They, they receive some different training regarding things that are specific to the schools. Um, and I, I believe, um, I don't think that they're part of the, uh, the total operations or, or uh, those personnel. Cause I think maybe that number two that you have would include like our motorcycle officers and others that are assigned within operations. But we only look at the numbers that are actually patrol and that are responding to those incidents where someone would be in crisis. Okay. I just, Every day, people are in crisis, even if the call isn't specifically a, a crisis call, or even if you pull someone over. So that's where I think, from Councilman Cooper's resolution about 100%, it, to me, again, I just want to reintroduce the idea that I spoke about last year that if you're responding to a domestic violence call, that's a mental health crisis. If you're, you know, if you have people who are in a um, uh, a traffic collision those folks are in a mental health crisis. So um, I just, that's where, again, I just kind of want to reemphasize that idea that mental health calls are, sure, there are ones that are specific to maybe someone being, um, having a diagnosis and maybe being symptomatic in that diagnosis, but that crisis intervention needs to be something that across disciplines, no matter whether it's, uh, a mental health specific call or all these others that 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 trauma informed lens should lend itself to um, how people interact with the folks that they're interacting with versus um, versus uh, just just seeing it as a traffic collision or a domestic violence call. So I just that's I just kind of wanted to follow up from Councilman Cooper's train of thought, but I don't go ahead, if, Councilman, if you have other things. I just like to say to that too, I couldn't agree more. And we know that that a majority of our calls, just because it's not classified as a mental health call, doesn't mean that there may not be some type of crisis there. So all of our officers do receive that type of training. They receive trauma-informed policing training that starts in the academy. Um, however, you know, we've said all along that that in working with the community policing work group, um, these are things that they're looking at. And I there's there's those are things that I don't disagree with that we do need more people that are more specialized and more specially trained to deal with that. But it's also too, that it's something that even if you run somebody through the training, 
um, they're still not going to have that level of what a CIT is because it's kind of like, you know, I was a negotiator for many years. That's a very difficult school and it takes a lot of time to receive that certification. Not everybody can be a negotiator, um, but you have those that are available to do that. So, but I do think that is a big part of what we're training our officers and what we're teaching them to deal with is that every call potentially you have somebody in crisis, especially in today's day and age, you know, with the pandemic, people have lost their jobs, other things like that. So I couldn't agree with you more. I think we're speaking the same language and uh, um, you're exactly right. Okay. Thank you, Chief, very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Oh, well, so wait, I, do we have any oh. folks that have signed up to? Yes, yes. I'm I'm just gonna, gonna this, I, I kind of wanted to, I feel like yeah. I have a few other questions, but I kind of want to wait um, and let them simmer and just see if answers pop up from anything that folks are calling in. I just know I saw some stuff on social media, assuming but folks were going to be calling yes. in. So. Yeah, we have, a, we have a few and uh, Citizens to be Heard is the very next thing. So, but I, I, I don't see why you couldn't comment after that. If oh, okay, so they didn't sign up on, I just, I didn't know how, I just remember last year some folks signed up on. Into, uh, I mean, we, we're gonna, they're gonna be next one way or the other. Okay, so. <laughs> well then I'll just go ahead with my question. Um, okay. uh, specifically, I think about the, um, and I, forgive me, I'm gonna forget completely what it stands for, but the VCAT is what I'm gonna call it. I hate, I hate acronyms because I wanna say what it's actually for, but I know it was uh, crime apprehension team, maybe I forget what the violent crimes apprehension team. Um, how much, so is that an initiative that we're spending money on or is that just more a change in process and philosophy and thought about how we address harms once they have happened? It's a little bit, uh, first of all, in the funding, it's, it's funding that we already had. It's a unit that when we had the gang enforcement unit, we disbanded that unit and replaced it with these officers, these, these specially trained officers. So um, there wasn't an increase in funding. It was just reallocating staff and it was a reallocation or a, 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 a reimagining of um, our philosophies and how we deal with violent crime and how we respond to those. For example, studies have shown that the quicker you get officers out on the scene and start conducting a follow-up on, on any type of shooting, the more likely you are to solve that. So what we've seen through this um, even though we may be having an increase or an uptick in uh, violent crime or in shootings or in homicides, we're solving more of those at a much more rapid rate. In most cases, when we have a shooting, especially where someone has been hit, we're solving those somewhere between 24 to 48 hours, at least identifying who the suspects are, even if we don't have them in custody yet. And then with our homicides too, I believe so far this year, um, I think we're at 28 homicides and I believe um, we're at 23 that have been solved. So it's somewhere around 81% on the homicides. And so it's just a way to better respond to those things. And then also too, working with analysts to determine trends and where the crimes are happening so that maybe we can get in those areas, target the individuals that are most likely to be committing those crimes um, or are committing those crimes and prevent those things from escalating further into something more violent. Okay, and how, so how much is that um, initiative? Like, what is the cost on that? What is our financial impact of spend, of paying for those, that team, I guess? It, it really wouldn't be any different because if they weren't there, they would be on the streets. They would still be performing uh, patrol related functions. So it's just the cost of the officers. Okay, and do we have an idea of what that is, or at least like a number, how many officers are included in that team? We can get you that. Okay, because I think the thing, um, and this sort of harkens back to something, I saw a press release that was sort of about this team, I think it was at the end of 2020, um, that talked about prevention, that it was, that this was a violence prevention initiative, and um, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't heard about this. So I went in to look at it and I realized it's really more about responding to something once it's happened. And so I think, again, kind of going back to Councilman Cooper's resolution and the idea of violence intervention is that, um, and I think, you know, you speaking about the truancy issue as it's more than 
youth just not showing up for school, there's something else going on. And so I think even in the case of Raya Thomas and the two people who were apprehended in that, whatever led to Raya and her family being in the crosshairs of some other conflict happening in the community that ended up with, with people with weapons, um, projectile weapons such as guns, um, like those things were, something was bro broiling, boiling before that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think it, you know, when, when I feel, I just, I worry that once these initiatives start to come up and we start to potentially wring our hands about how much they cost, I just want to think about the outcomes of those, those programs and other communities and the ways that they've impacted violent crime rates and, and harms happening in communities um, with the opportunity to prevent those things, um, especially if we're spending a certain amount of money and responding to them once they happen. Um, I even think about the, the issue, the, the, the shooting um, down here at Wheeler Park of Victor Feliz, you know, that again, wasn't a conflict that arose out of nowhere people knew each other, they had a conflict, and then they had access to a gun. Um, and that conflict boiled into using that gun. Um, so there's other, so I just, I, especially when we talk about the violence interruption programming that, um, that was included in Councilman Cooper's resolution and that the working group has been looking at, um, to me, there's a lot of value in spending some money on that because, you know, we'd have Victor, we could potentially have Raya rather than, um, you know, feeling like justice is incarcerating two people who are potentially incarcerating two people who, um, you know, that incarceration isn't gonna bring Raya back. It's not gonna help her family necessarily. And it's probably even just gonna further the downward spiral of those two individuals who then will someday be back, probably back out in the community and we have to spend who knows how much public funds um, helping them get back reintegrated in the community. So um, I, again, I know, um, you know, obviously, I'm, I mean, elephant in the room, this is a loaded subject, right? Like I'm, I recognize that everyone's probably been looking at me waiting for like, when she's gonna say defund, I don't know, but like, uh, I just, I don't want this moment to pass without us recognizing that um, our view and our discussion of public safety in our community, I think has been very narrow for a long time. And the opportunities that we have to widen that, um, that perception of um, non-law enforcement work um, as, as responders to community crises and, and issues in the community, um, you know, and again, I think going this conversation about understaffing, we've been presenting our community with only one tool for so long, and that's police as the as the pe people who can respond to these various crises. Um, so when we think about understaffing, you know, how much of that could be re replaced with mental health workers, crisis responders, um, paramedics versus, uh, you know, uniformed, you know, have a gun on the hip um response to uh to a mental health crisis um so i just I don't want the moment to pass without saying that and kind of especially from that violent crimes you know i think um it's easy to talk about the mental health crisis response but um even within violence in our communities it's something that people study people know we have data about what leads to those sorts of violence and we have other communities um you know newark uh Mayor Holt himself is the um, co-chair of the Reimagining Public Safety for uh, Task Force for um, for uh, the National League of Cities and is co-chair with the mayor of Newark who helped champion these kinds of violence interruption programs that have, have helped decrease their violent crime. So um, I guess that's all I have and I appreciate the um, information about the, the cost of that, that violent crime team um, when you have it available, thanks. Thank you. I have a couple of questions as we're looking at this also. Um, well, three in particular. Violent crime apprehension team, the VCAT that you talked about, 1.7% use of force, zero complaints. I am curious to know, um, even with that, how many of 
the officers, if any, uh, maybe had to go through some type of, of training uh, resulting because of that use of force, even though there were zero complaints. A uh, second question, police recruit project. Will you explain that in relation to uh, diversity and inclusion and also how many, um, what our class was for this last year, because that's really been my concern uh, with our past recruit classes since I've been on council. I've only counted five um, officers that are black that have uh, went through the recruitment process out of over 70. And I could be wrong even um, with the class numbers that I have in my head, uh, but I know it's well over at least 40 per class and we're on three. So that's over a hundred folks. And also as we're looking at media expansion, um, I, I would hope that we would make sure that whoever we're bringing on, we have some cultural competency in those posts because we have had some, some very difficult posts posted uh, pertaining to our, our police department in offenders in words um, that have been used that were not culturally competent uh, in, in how we would like to be pertaining to our, our city as far as how we express um, what is happening. Uh, so I'm, I'm, if you can help me with those, those were the three questions that I had. On the uh, recruit classes, did you say the last three classes or I think you gave a number there? Um, I've been here, I think it's been only three for me, if I'm not mistaken, I could be wrong, but that's what I'm aware of. Okay, I'll get you those numbers um, on the, uh, uh, the uh, class makeup of those, of those classes um, for the last three, uh, last three classes and then what's in currently now um, and uh, what we have coming up. I think we've got all the hires for the next class that's coming up too, but I'll make sure that we get that, those numbers to you. And then um, as far as recruiting, um, we work very hard on our recruiting. We have uh, recruiters that are constantly going out in the community. For example, we just had a sort of a, for lack of a better term, a recruiting fair at our training center, had a very good turnout for that. Um, it is challenging times right now to recruit, not only here within the city, but all over the country. Because of the negative stigma and things that are, that are targeting law enforcement, we have a lot of people that are leaving um, and we have less people that are applying for the job. So it does become more challenging. And I think as a community, that's, that's something we can all take a part in, in trying to make it something that people want to do and they want to be a part of their community and they want to help spark that change. Um, we have a specific minority recruiter. Uh, we have that spot. It, it currently rotates. And the reason it rotates is we want to get younger people in there. Um, but people don't want to spend their whole career there, especially young in their career. But we want people that have recently gone through the process that have experienced that and experienced the difficulties that they receive outside of the job as well and talk about um, you know, why they chose to overcome that and become police officers. But it is a challenge. We're always trying to meet that need. We do work very hard with that. We go to uh, local colleges and, uh, um, you know, we look at the military and other things where, where we know we can, we can target a, a diverse group of individuals. So we do work very hard at that, um, but it is something that's always a challenge. And it's not just for us. It's police departments all around the country that struggle with that. Um, as far as the, uh, um, the posts and the media relations, I think these two positions are actually going to help us be better at that because the, the personnel that we've hired are people that have um, great experience in the media, uh, in the, uh, in the, uh, um, you know, the not only local news channels, but, but around the country as well. And so they provide a little more perspective to that that maybe we as police officers don't have. And so I do believe that that will help us um, in some of that. We, we follow the rules, not only of the social media platforms that we follow, their, their best practices, policies that they have in place, but then we also too follow everything as far as the Open Records Act and anything that we post. So we have to make sure that those posts do follow the laws as well. Um, and then what was your first question? I'm sorry, I, I didn't get that one written down before you moved into recruiting. I believe you answered it. You said you were going to get me information as okay. far as the, the VCAP program. Um, and I know you probably explained it more in your presentation. And I don't know if I just missed 
what exactly this police recruit project is, but if you could just give me that information so I can have better understanding of what it is compared to what it was before and what the difference is. And I think you um, pointed out the key point, there's one minority recruitment officer for our whole city. And, and technically, I think we could really do better, especially I know with our fire department, we have at least two. Um, so maybe there's a way for us to look at increasing just that number. And I know uh, even with the conversations I've had previously uh, between you and our previous chief, as far as what that looks like, and even this particular position of it rolling, um, and as it being a, a special, I can't remember what the title of it is, it's a, instead of actual minority recruitment, unless that has changed, um, I, I would be privy to, to not have known that before if it has changed. Um, but what that looks like in, in comparison for us to really be able to do some good work in recruiting really good folks from neighborhoods that have been impacted because um, clearly, we all want to be protected and served, but we want all of us to say we feel protected and served at the same time. So those were, um, that's just really the, the main part of that. If you can make sure I can get those two things, that would be very helpful. Thank you so much. Chief, I, I'm sorry, this, a couple other um, inquiries. Um, one, so, and of course you already know this, but I've done two ride-alongs, both at Spring Lake and Hefner. I've attended the trauma-informed policing and the um, use of force, I believe, training. Would it be possible to attend the um, any of the CIT training that the, the team itself receives? That's my first question. Is that a possibility? We're going to have our CIT coordinator, Lieutenant Jason Knight, um, get with you and uh, answer any questions you have about that. And, and uh, um, yes, I mean, if, if there's something going on or even a ride along, if you want to do a ride along with a CIT officer, we can arrange that. Um, but he would be better to coordinate that and coordinate the answer and to the responses that that you're uh, that you're asking about. That'd be that'd be really, really, really helpful. Um, yeah, I think that's my my main one. Although I will also add um, to Councilwoman Nice's point about the cultural competency competency, excuse me, regarding media relations. Um, I don't know what input at all you all are accepting, if any, uh, as it relates to that. But I would love to chat with you all, uh, the two, the new hires as well because that is my background is film studies, as you know, and I'm particularly interested in a shift that we start seeing in the 80s nationally when it comes to local news coverage um, or even a show like Cops. Um, I think there was a lot of, no, I mean, I think much research exists on the harmful um, uh, effects of a lot of, um, not just local media coverage, but even 24 hour cable news coverage of, of, um, of crime. Um, and I'd, I'd like to kind of learn a little bit more from these folk, because as you said, they, they might be, have some expertise I don't, but if possible, I'd like to share a little bit about what I know uh, as well from peer reviewed research, um, et cetera. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Um, we'll, we'll have someone reach out to you with that as well and, uh, and have that coordinated. But yes, that's definitely a possibility. Okay. Please then, add me to that list. I'm sorry to interrupt, um, especially with the background that I have in broadcast journalism. I think it, it would be good to have a lot of eyes and ears as we look at how that could uh, be best for our city and representation. So thank you very much. I was thinking it, I didn't want to sign you up for it though. So I'm glad you, <laughs> um, <clears throat> and then finally, and I really appreciate the deputy chiefs a year ago reaching out to me about, and I believe you helped connect to me with them about regarding the wellness um, training, uh, because as you are very well aware, one of the six resolution items is also 
to, you know, strengthen that, that program even further so that our officers um, have access to that kind of 24 seven mental health care. Um, last year was a fire hose uh, just in the face of, um, of me as I was doing that work with everybody last year toward these efforts. Uh, so I didn't get a chance to really dig down deep. Is it possible to set up, um, and maybe it needs to be multiple, but I'd like to be able to set up with the folk who are really doing that wellness work uh, to sit down and do like an in-depth, like have them walk me through what the wellness program looks like um, so that I can just kind of, I'm sure they're doing this already with the working group, but again, I'd like, I would like to better understand this so that when people are asking me about it um, and why I wanted to strengthen it even further, uh, I think that would be very helpful. So is that possible to, I mean, and I'm guessing, because I remember it was a huge book of, <laughs> of training and work. So it might be a series of conversations, but is that, is that possible? I'm, I'm ready if you all are able. Absolutely. I'll have our uh, wellness um, coordinator uh, talk to you about that. And, and you're right. I, I want to say it's, it's the next working group meeting. I believe our uh, um, Lieutenant Don Holland, who is our wellness coordinator, will be doing a presentation about um, everything to do with wellness and what we're doing and where we're going. And because it is, it's always going to be a work in progress. Um, but uh, I know he is doing a presentation and I believe it's at the next working group meeting. And then I'm sure he's listening, but my, uh, our Ward 2 Chief of Staff, Boyd Fulton, I know he's been interested in possibly joining me for a ride along as well. So this might, with the, um, with the crisis intervention team, this might be an opportunity because, you know, he receives, our council staff, we receive so many um, calls and they are real, I mean, they are really at the forefront of a lot of this work. So I'm sure he's listening and I'm sure he's uh, <laughs> following along. So that's just something I was, might be an opportunity um, when your folk reach out to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Chief Corley. Yes. Barbara Yard. Hey, so I just wonder a couple questions, clarification. So if I heard you right through this process, about 1,100, um, 1,100 and a half officers, uh, sworn officers total, about 600 of those patrol officers. And we think the number should be somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,600 right now, based on our 2008 study that came out in 2012. Is that right? Correct. Um, they, they recommended at that time that we immediately add 142 officers and then that we add 35 a year. And it only went up to 2020, um, which if we followed along that, that path, um, the numbers around 1,556 that we should have today, according to that study. Okay. Do you know, did that study consider, uh, were they expecting that 1,556 to be patrol officers or was it a total head count? It was a total headcount, just you know that like we have now to manage, um, okay. to manage you know the the city as a whole. It takes a lot of support staff, a lot of you know the more officers you have um, out there, and the more instances that are occurring, you have to have more investigative staff and support staff and things like that. Now that did not include the non-sworn professional staff; that was just um, sworn numbers. Okay. Can you talk briefly about? What are the hours that the recruit class goes through for their total training? Oh gosh, um, I'll have to get that for you. I don't have it on top of my head, but it's it's a lot. It's way more than what um, what the state mandates. Um, we we more than uh, double that, if not triple it. I mean, we we they are put through a lot of training. It's a little over. Um, I believe it's at uh, twenty eight weeks right now. Um, is what they what they do, but I'll, I'll get you more accurate numbers on that. Um, the amount of training that the recruits go through. Okay, and I'd like to and know. It doesn't how include many... FDO. Even after they graduate, they go through field training as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. After uh, the CIT program is training after the fact too, but the officers go through a certain crisis intervention training during the recruit class, correct? Correct. All of our officers are trained in mental health response. They're just not all trained as CIT. And we have, um, we're required by law to conduct mental health training each year for all of our 
uh, current employees, not just the new ones coming on, our current officers. And that's part of what reality-based training um, does as well, is they, is they can provide scenarios to the officers that would, that would simulate dealing with someone who's struggling with a mental health issue. And how many hours per year is that? It's, it varies because um, like the, the state only requires that you have, um, I believe it's, it's like an hour or two hours of mental health training each year. So we don't just do that. So they might sit in a classroom for that portion, but then after that, they're going to go through some scenarios and they're going to get more training with that as well. And it doesn't include, you know, circumstances where um, like right now with reality-based training, that's really expanded what we're doing. Our goal starting in uh, 2022 will be that we pull each shift um, around the city. Each shift will be pulled off the street at one point, usually on like a full shift night or something like that. And they'll go through scenarios as a group because we want them to train together with the group that they'll normally work with, their supervisors and everybody else. So, so that amount of training um, really is, is much higher than what the, the state mandates. Do you think you would be able to, if given enough time, be able to tell me how many hours of training you think our officers get a year in mental health training just based on our current programs, as well as what you're projecting for this next year with the changes we already know that are coming? Absolutely. I'll be able to get that for you. Okay. And then um, let's see. Next question. Uh, I want to appreciate VCAT uh, for, for the efforts that they're doing, taking violent offenders off the street. Most of the time, those offenders are, are not a one and done. Um, situation. So I, I, I do feel like that that, that proactive effort is um, really making a difference in the city. And just the numbers in this last year are, are remarkable. So I want to appreciate them for that. What additional training do the VCAT members have to go through in order to be qualified for that team? Just at a high level. They're, they're very specialized. Most of uh, um, uh, those members, the, the way we comprised it, because we wanted them to be able to respond to any difficult or violent situation. So we have tactical team members that are part of that unit. We have um, people that can write search warrants that have investigative experience. Um, we, we have people that uh, um, are over there, you know, who are, who are able to, to uh, uh, that are crisis intervention team officers. So it really, they're very specialized and that was the reason they were chosen. A lot of them are also instructors in one of the major disciplines and uh, um, you know, such as our de-escalation and control and defensive tactics. They're also certified in less lethal. Um, and so they have a little bit more of our less lethal equipment that, uh, um, that we don't, you know, that not every officer has so that they are able to better resolve some situations that, that oftentimes maybe a, a patrol officer that's just assigned to a field duty may not be able to, to uh, um, resolve themselves without some help. We wanted to get as much specialty people, specialized, tra specialty trained people involved in that unit as possible. And that's what we've done. Okay. And then what when it comes to recruiting, uh, two, two questions, I guess. Uh, number one, does the police department still have an active explorer post? And are you seeing any recruiting coming from that participation if you do? That's my first question. Thank you for bringing that up. I forgot about that. Our cadet program um, is something that has been very helpful um, in recruiting uh, inner city kids, kids that are, um, that grew up here, that want to be police officers. And the cadet program um, has resulted, we, we have several officers that have come out of that program and become police officers. It took several years for that to come to fruition. Uh, I know I, for one, was a little impatient waiting on that, but I didn't realize a lot of these kids start when they're 16, 17 years old. So it takes a few years before they can even be old enough. But now that we're seeing more of those kids reach 21 years of age, we're seeing a lot of success with that. And the great thing about that program too, and you guys are probably familiar, you see the cadets in your building, is not only do we end up recruiting some of them and they become police officers, but the ones that don't, that choose a different path, they earn leadership and life skills that I think is really um, helping them become better members of the community and become more successful. And so that is, that's a great program. I was able to, um, Councilwoman Young, I'm sorry if I interrupted you, but um, I was able to find out that the recruits 
Uh, it is 28 weeks that they go through just in the academy, not including field training, and it's 1,100 hours total that they receive. Okay, thank you. And then my, my final question is, what as council members can we do to help you with recruiting? so that we can get to the numbers that we need. Right now, as, as you are well aware, and we've talked about before, um, response times in the outer lying areas of the city where the majority of my constituents are and, you know, need some help, need some help out there. Um, so how can we help you from here accomplish those goals citywide? That's a great question. And I don't think it just applies to council. I think it applies to all of us as a community. We, we tell our police officers all the time that they're our greatest recruiters and that we want them going out and talking about what a great job it is to be able to serve the community and do something that has purpose and uh, you know really do something that you're feeling like you're making a difference. And that's the kind of people that we want. Um, and I think as, as council persons, I think it's uh, each of you, when you go out and you meet with influential members in your community and in your wards that that try to um, that it's good to try and highlight the positive things that we're doing and let people know that one of the things that I hear from officers all the time during an interview when I used to sit on the interview boards as a deputy chief and as a major, um, they, they love the Oklahoma City Police Department, the people that apply because of the opportunities that they have to do different things. And so I think a lot of times people have in their mind that all we are is a, is a uh, uh, police department that has patrol related functions because that's what you see. Well, that's a big part of who we are. And we want people that, um, that are gonna come in and, and wanna work hard as though at those jobs as well. They need to understand that there's a lot, a lot of opportunity over a career that usually spans between 20 to 35 years that you can do. We have a lot of other things. They can go into investigations. They can go into, um, you know, campus resources or school resources or other programs that we have. There's a lot of opportunity and things that most smaller organizations don't have. And I think that's the biggest thing is just help us get the word out about the good things that we're doing and the opportunities that exist for someone who wants to do this job. Well, thank you for that. And I apologize, but I did skip over one of my questions. Earlier in the presentation, you talked about the email address um, for Oklahoma City Public Schools, where if officers have um, a trauma-related event for youth that they can use uh, to notify the schools. Is that only available for Oklahoma City Public Schools or are other districts involved in that also? That's a good question too. I, I should have mentioned that when I was talking about it. Um, when we originally set this up, that was I was in the meetings with the uh, school staff that were putting this together. And that's one of the things I pointed out to them is we have so many different school districts within Oklahoma City. And so what they agreed to, because it's so much easier for our officers, is there's one email address and then they will figure out um, uh, where that child attends school. They have access to those records. And so um, they do run into those instances where we'll send them information on a child that um, is not part of Oklahoma City Schools and they do route it to the correct school district. Thank you for that. Thank you and your officers for your service to our community every day. Thank you. Thank each of you. Okay. Thank you, Chief. Appreciate you and your, and your team very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, before we roll into citizens uh, who signed up to speak, because it's kind of a mix of item 4D and item 5, is there anything you want to say in conclusion, Mr. City Manager, before we roll into that? No, I, I appreciate Chief and his uh, leadership here and the work that they're doing to try to move us in a good direction. And working hand in hand with the task force and community policing working groups, I really do appreciate that. Um, and uh, we are going to have like the... the um, budget, uh, budget Director said earlier, we'll have three more public hearings where we'll have presentations of department budgets and then the final public hearing on June 8th for the adoption of the budget. So looking forward to the process. Any feedback you have, we will have that line open for the open comments and be summarizing that and providing that information to the uh, council. Okay, thank you. Definitely very grateful to Doug and the budget team, Chief Kelly, LaShawn, uh, Chief Worley. This was a great morning of presentations and I know a lot of work goes into it. Okay. Uh, now we've got some citizens to be heard who signed up to speak, and I'm going to get this started, and then at some point in there, I have to step away, and uh, and so from after the first speaker, the clerk will read the names out, and then on the other end of the, on the other side of this, Vice Mayor Nice will uh, bring this meeting home. So, 
First up, uh, and a reminder to everybody, at the beginning of your remarks, please state your name and address, and you have three minutes. I believe there's usually a clock on the screen, but uh, in any case, with 30 seconds left, the clerk uh, will remind you that you are near the end of your time, and then at three minutes, your time will expire, and, we'll, and uh, the clerk will call the next speaker. So our first one is Daniel Bronco. Is Daniel on the line? See Daniel. Daniel, are you there? And and push star six on your phone if you're having trouble, but we can't hear you at the moment. Okay, nothing. All right. Suzanne Rogers. Can you guys hear me? Is this Daniel? Hello? Who is that? I can't hear you. Daniel, we can hear you. Was that you, Daniel? Speak again. Okay, we'll move on again to try to move on to Suzanne Rogers. Not on the line, okay. Uh, Patty Cook, Coke, Patch. I have no doubt Patty will help us pronounce her name correctly. Can you hear me? Yes, is that you, Patty? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, if you wouldn't mind stating your name, address, keep your remarks to three minutes, and the next speakers will be announced by the clerk. Thank you, Patty. The floor is yours. Uh, my name is Patty Cook. My address is 5101 Northwest 20th Street, Oklahoma City. I'm in Ward 3. Um, I am president of Windsor Forest Neighborhood Association, and as their representative right now, we are totally supporting the Oklahoma City Police Department and their budget increase. We have had such a wonderful working relationship with Sergeant Scala, Sergeant LaRousse, and the rest of the Oklahoma City Police Department. They come to our meetings. Um, they are very good with their PR. Several years ago, there were two federal grants, and it really helped the relationship with the police in this area um, with interaction with the, with the citizens. Um, I can't say enough good things about our police department. I think they're fantastic. And I think too many times um, you were discussing about media. I think too many times we don't hear about all the good things they do. And they do do a lot of good things. And, and don't ask for a pat on the back. They just, they do them. And I just want everyone to know how much we, as the citizens in Windsor Forest, appreciate and support our Oklahoma City Police Department. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Patty. Thank you. Do we have Walker Milligan online? I do not see him. Nicole McAfee. Nick Singer. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, my name is Nick Singer. My address is 6032 Smith Boulevard. I come today um, as a citizen uh, concerned about public safety in our city. Uh, I'm glad to hear uh, some of the city's uh, priorities uh, for next year because budgets are a moral document and our spending priorities show what we value. The comments today focus on two primary concerns, social services and policing. These issues are directly con connected. We spend a lot of money on policing, but we often struggle to fund things that many citizens in our community need. On top of that, the city has spent years funding a lot of misplaced priorities. Five years ago, I spent six months before this body asking them to address homelessness and panhandling with social service programs. The response has been to spend more than a million dollars losing court cases to defend a cruel ordinance criminalizing panhandling. 
five years later, you're going to spend less on a new array of social services. I'm not a budget expert, but this number needs to be increased. And I'm talking about the 1.3 million that was discussed um, for mental health and other programs. There is tremendous need in our community. With regard to policing, they are often called to respond to many situations with increasingly negative outcomes. OKCPD is the second most deadly police force in the nation per capita. Six officers have been charged this year in two different murders. This is the tip of the iceberg. It is concerning the police seem unable or unwilling to address this, instead choosing to manipulate statistics to distort reality or ignore it altogether. And to talk about the training that keeps frequently getting referenced, it, whatever it is that they are, say they're doing, it does not seem to be yielding the results based on the data. We have tried to criminalize, brutalize, or punish our behaviors we don't like. This doesn't work. The police consume tremendous resources, kill a lot of people and solve relatively few crimes and continue to demand more and more. We must stop sending good money after bad outcomes. We know the police respond to many things where criminalization does not make it better. Traffic violations, welfare checks, mental health concerns, addiction and poverty generally all impact public safety. 30 seconds remaining. Thank you. But we're sending law enforcement, um, but it's where sending law enforcement doesn't lead to better outcomes. A lot of this is, maybe about culture, but it also, but it is also we are responding to problems with the wrong tool. It's the old saying, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We are all about good starts, but we know the calls that are coming in and the challenges people face. We should reallocate re more resources to address those problems. Thank you. Thank you. We have Derek Scarcella. Good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to voice my concerns today um, on the proposed police budget. Uh, my name is Derek Scarcella and I'm a resident of Councilman Stone's Ward, Ward 4 in South Oklahoma City. I'm a registered voter, I'm a taxpayer, but I'm most proud to call myself a mother and a teacher. On the night of November 23rd, 2020, I witnessed the execution style murder of 15 year old Stavian Rodriguez at the hands of the Oklahoma City Police Department. That night I was illegally detained for nearly four hours just to give a witness statement. During that time, I observed multiple efforts by the police to manipulate and intimidate witnesses. They seemed to have no problem with openly violating my civil liberties. That was nearly six months ago and the Oklahoma City Police Department is still holding steady as the second deadliest police force in the nation, all while still sucking up nearly a third of our general budget fund. This is unacceptable. So Chief Gorley, you might understand my concern that such a large part of your budget to grow community trust is to essentially disseminate propaganda. If you want to grow trust, you have to put in the work with us. I have never once sat down and talked to you. You've never asked for my community input. So city council members, your constituents, we are literally crying out for justice. Our communities and families are being ripped apart every day by drug addiction, untreated mental health issues, and an inflated police force that believes iPads can replace dignified mental health care. It's offensive. Couple that with our deeply underfunded public education system, our kids don't stand a chance. And yet, Chief Gorley, I see nothing significant about the budget that you have presented to us today. They don't reflect our voices, and any changes that have been proposed are nothing more than a public relations stunt. It seems to me that if the city council really cared about reducing uh, community violence and improving our lives, they would look at the research and the vast majority of that research tells us that we don't need more community over policing. We need to fund non-law enforcement, community-led prevention strategies that work. Strategies like having alternative mental health response programs and a, and a comprehensive violence interruption initiative. Those things work. 
Unfortunately, I've come to learn that when individuals refuse to follow the research, it's usually because they're too busy trying to follow the money. Thank you, City Council. Thank you. Cameo Holland. Hello, um, my name is Cameo Holland and my address is 3301 Warrior Court 73121. Um, so Chief Garley, um, he spoke repeatedly um, about the pandemic and um, how that had uh, reduced um, resources and effectiveness in his department. Um, it didn't reduce the number of um, citizens that they killed last year, including my son, my 15 year old son that um, Ms. Garcella just spoke about. Um, I'm surprised Chief Gorley even presented the presentation because he does not too often um, take the opportunity to uh, be a leader, even when it is his job. If you notice, he blew straight through the mission statement, unlike the other leaders that presented today, because um, he's not about carrying out that mission statement. Um, and, you know, I could tell my story or my feelings, but I'd rather concentrate on some of the um, comments that he made, um, such as how they command and reinforce officers when they do well. What about when they don't do well? What about when they murder unarmed children? Um, like the police department, they don't need any more money to help people. They uh, need to redirect the money they already have. Um, the, the fire and the municipal um, presentations, they, they actually spoke to how they use data to implement data-driven situations and then were able to show how those things they implemented have actually had positive results. Chief Gorley didn't do that. He never does that because he's not interested in data. He's interested in his own agenda. And as was mentioned before, that is where all this um, propaganda comes from. It's not, um, it's not about data and solutions. Um, his presentation showed that um, anytime you ask the man for data, he doesn't have it. Anytime that you uh, get, you know, present him with data, he will come back and argue, even if he does it politely, that it's not accurate um, or that, you know, he, he's got to get to that later. Um, there's not any more time for any more data gathering. It's not even 30 seconds gathering. remaining. Um, yeah, and three minutes was not, not nearly long enough, but the bottom, bottom line is the man is a self-serving liar and, um, he, he's incompetent at his job that the data for that speaks for itself and that would be um reason in and of itself to deny any type of request that he has because he doesn't even need to be in the position that he has he wants to talk about listening to the community okay we have chris Kremen online Can you please hit star six? Are you there, Chris? Hello. Thank you. My Can you state your name Chris and address? Trimmon. Yes, my name is Chris Trimmon. Say them. I am a resident of Ward 6, living at 2527 West 20th here in Oklahoma City. Uh, my comment today is a request for city leaders to craft a budget that addresses the material roots of public safety. If you look at the top causes of death in Oklahoma, it is clear what truly threatens public safety, poor heart health, preventable disease, car crashes, suicide, and substance abuse. The highest and best uses for public safety funding are public health, public transit, mental health, and substance abuse treatment. I'd like to call on the council to reject the proposed police budget and redirect a significant amount of those funds toward these true public safety policies. Oklahoma City's police force continues to be one of the deadliest in the nation. Much of what our police force does directly threatens public safety. 
such as traffic stops, or resource officers, or the deploying of tear gas to disperse assemblies. I'm therefore calling for fewer officers and fewer weapons and resources available to those officers. I commend the work that Councillor Cooper and others have done in preparing recommendations for improved training and crisis response. But I would like to reiterate that those of us who have lost trust in OKCPD do not want the police to be the organizations responsible for violence intervention in the first place. We continue to see incidents of police violence across the country, regardless of the level of training or the use of force policies in place in the jurisdictions in question. No policies are a substitute for reducing the amount of contact between police and the public. So once again, I would like to call on the council to reject any budget that increases or leaves flat funding for the Oklahoma City Police Department, even for the purposes of funding new trainings or pilot programs. Any funding for such programs should come out of the existing police budget because reducing police personnel is in and of itself a critical component of public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Jess Eddy. Can you please state your name and address for the record? Jess Eddy, 419 Hill. Um, just got to point out, cut off the mother of Stavian Rodriguez speaks to the inhumanity of the city of Oklahoma City. Um, you know, I'm talking to Craig Freeman, who I deem most responsible for the deaths of numerous p innocent people throughout this city over his tenure. Um, Wade Gurley is just an incompetent puppet and tool of the FOP, but this speaks to policing in Oklahoma City and throughout the nation. What Oklahoma City Police and what police actually are is a military unit and branch of conservative politics um, that are an invading force in communities they disagree with. So it makes sense that white residents are going to be happy and peaceful with, and comfortable with policing, but it makes a lot of sense why communities that disagree with policing, black communities, brown communities who object to uh, conservative politics and fascism and uses of force to um, get people into line, um, don't feel safe and comfortable with policing. And as somebody who's engaged with individual patrol officers on a street level basis, what you see giving rise to numerous uses of force is, is actually just a cultural dispute on various things, but number one, about how to respect policing. We recently saw this use of force against this black man who was doing nothing but being disrespectful to police and he was assaulted um, and, and, and use of force, excessive use of force and unnecessary. And that's the reality um, in, in the communities in Oklahoma City. Those who are opposed to policing as it exists um, in terms of j justifiable uses of force being used by OKCPD at every instance of use of force. I don't, I can't remember a time when Gurley said this was an unjustified use of force. Um, those communities uh, that have been experiencing those unjustified uses of forces on a frequent basis um, are being, not being respected, not being incorporated and included in conversations, members of the task force were handpicked by the mayor to create, seconds remaining. create a conversation that would lead to continued outcomes and continued perpetuation of police use of force. But we're not gonna get anywhere with what you all are doing with these shenanigans of having fake conversations. Um, we in the community are going to continue to confront this and resist the fascist, pol racist police force that you have that you have and possess and that you're perpetuating. Do we have J.B. Williams? Hello, can, can you hear me? Yes, if you can state your name and address for the record. Yeah, my name is J.B. Williams. My address is uh, 2320 Northeast 26. And, um, I just I, I was listening and the the lady who was at the beginning of the call 
she talked about how how much she appreciates the police in her community. And she talked about how she knows their names. You know, the reason that she knows the names of those officers is probably because those officers are from her community. And it's probably because those officers care about her community. My neighborhood doesn't have that luxury. None of the officers in my community look like me. None of the officers in my community are from my community. None of the officers in my community um, are, are there to protect and serve. They are, they are there to, to keep us in line. And that's the difference. And if it were the other way around and I, I had the same experience with officers that she has had, then I would feel the same way. But whenever officers are in my community, the only interaction I have had is, that it's, is them trying to keep us in line. I think that we have a unique opportunity right now, um, you know, with this budget. If we're talking about budgeting and money, I think that some of the money should go to the families who are affected by by police killings. I mean, there there there, there are so many so many um, there are so many things that we could talk about that are that are um, right. She said that we don't talk about the things that the good things the officers do. I think I think we do. And, and the, 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 um, the hard part about that is, is that when it's time to talk about the things that are wrong, we don't like to talk about those things because it makes us uncomfortable. Well, I'm uncomfortable every single day in my community anytime I see a po police officer because I feel like even though I haven't, I've done something wrong. And anytime I interact with them, I'm treated as if I'm done, I've done something wrong. And that's not okay. And I think that if we're trying to redirect budget and money, we need to focus on trying to get people in, in my ward and in my community, officers that look like us, not officers that come from Yukon and from Mustang, who see our community as people they need to keep in line. And I'm done. Thank you. Do we have Walker Milliken? Hello. Uh, my name is Walker Milligan. My address is 409 Northwest 33rd Street. Um, I would echo that it really showed some cold bloodedness to cut off the mother of someone who was murdered by the police. Well, uh, but I'll jump right into two things that I think are important is that for this mental health team, we do not need officers given more money for mental health. We need mental health professionals going out without police. I am a mental health professional. I am a licensed therapist in Oklahoma and I deal with people with mental health crisis every day. So I know what I'm talking about. We do not need officers who have had a voluntary training, which again, we need to stress the CIT training is voluntary. We don't need to fund more training. They have enough training. They don't choose to do it. Something I will say is that, so we said there's 19,000 mental health calls per year. Uh, I know for a fact that there's about 200,000 or 2,000 calls per day, so about 730,000 calls a year. So that means about 2.6% of the calls are mental health calls. 2.6% of the proposed budget would be $5.9 million, and we're offering $300,000. That's about 20 times less than what we would need. So, so that's, that's one thing. I've also done my own research into the OCPD calls, the 911 calls, and I'm happy to meet with any council person, any officer, anyone to go over what I've found, but I would believe that you could very reasonably say 10% or 200 calls a day could be defined as mental health calls. Again, I'm happy to meet with anyone. My email address is walker.milligan at gmail.com. Set up a meeting. I'm happy to go over that data with you. Um, so what I would say is that we need more funding and the funding we have needs to go to mental health professionals going out without officers. We don't need to train plumbers to do electrician work. That's dangerous, it's expensive, and it takes time. We already have electricians who know what they're doing. So we need to send those people out to deal with these people. It's about mentality, it's about culture, and these things are not things that you can change with a week-long training. That's all I've got, thanks. You. Jasmine Brown Jutras. Hi. Yes, can you state your name and address for the record, please? 
Yes, my name is Jasmine Brown Dutris and my address is 4101 Northwest uh, 51st Street. And I live in Oklahoma City. Um, so I was not going to speak today um, until I saw the presentation that Chief Gurley gave today. Um, I was extremely disappointed um, because of all the presentations today, his was the longest, but gave the least amount of information on the budget in which he was supposed to speak on. Um, he chose to speak for about five minutes about the money and where it was going, and then for an hour trying to convince us why OKCPD is a great place to be and to support. Um, I was not convinced. Um, in the beginning of your budget, you spoke, um, they spoke about the homicide cases that are still open and families that still have not received closure. I want it to be known that OKCPD have committed murders of their own and have yet to give the respects to the families. Um, to help to give closure by seeking justice for those families and, and, and charging those officers and holding them accountable. You had an opportunity to do that in this budget today, and you didn't. You, you chose to give a 5.7% increase to the police rather than addressing issues like an alternative to mental health response. Now, I've seen that we do have some money allocated to um, to some mental health things and some other um, of the um, resolutions that were proposed and some things that are happening within the task force. But it, it, the, the fact that there was no conversation in the budget that you have had opportunities to have conversations with these task force members. You have had opportunities to sit in on the discussions with these uh, subcommittees who are doing work around how do we have better conversation? How do we have better policing? You chose not to speak on that today. I know that the 21CP has not given the recommendation, but you had an opportunity to take the conversations you've had before this moment and show the city that you were listening and that you had an opportunity to do something about what you heard and reallocate that funding. And you didn't do that. So I say shame on you, Chief Gurley, shame on OKCPD for not addressing the, city, the residents in OKC who have told you time and time again, we need something and you gave them nothing in this budget. And you especially disrespected them by not even taking more than five minutes to tell us the line item issues that we, the line item of where this money is being reallocated, where this money is being put to. You spoke for five minutes about what you were supposed to talk about. The rest of the time you tried to convince me and the rest of us on why OKCPD is, is great. That's not what the discussion here is. This discussion here is to let you know that we need to see funding that goes to uh, mental health alternative response programs that have an alternate number and we also need to see uh, money going seconds. towards thank you we need to see money going towards a program that helps violence interrupt uh, and has a violence interruption program and that that's all i have for today i hope that you do better next time chief corley yes daniel bronco on the line Can you press star six? Yeah, I still can't hear you. And Vice Mayor Nice, um, those are all the citizens that we had today. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I do want to make mention um, before we adjourn a couple of things. Uh, we did pass this resolution that commits to a formal public hearing on the proposed annual budget for this fiscal year coming up uh, 2022 on June 8th, at which uh, the time our council will consider and discuss proposed budget, and we may adopt the budget as proposed or amended, reject it or defer it to a later date. Uh, hearing date. So I just wanted us to be mindful of that item, that part of our resolution that was passed on today. And also um, do want to make mention as well to Councilperson Cooper and uh, I, I can't remember who said it, Councilperson Cooper or Hammond, uh, that the okc.gov forward slash budget, the uh, response is live. So people can go onto that site to respond to what they have heard today um, and look at the other budget proposals that are a part of our fiscal year for 2022. Uh, you can also go to and text the Action Center with your feedback at 405-252-1053. And you can also mail a letter 
if you would like to send your correspondence by mail uh, to our city clerk, 200 North Walker, Suite 200, OKC, Oklahoma, 73102. Um, are there any other comments from our council members? All right, with that, hearing none, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>